All right, at this time, I have to call the community development, community development committee meeting to order. Um, can we have a roll call, please? Roll call. Councilmember King, Chair. Here. Councilmember Moreno. Councilmember DeRusso. Here. Councilmember Morell. Councilmember Harris. Here. We have three members and a four. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to call for approval of the October 12th, 2021 minutes and the December 7th, 2021 minutes. So moved. I'll second. Call the vote. Aye. Aye. Motion. Uh, the minutes approved, I'm sorry. Um, so before we get started, I want to take a moment to thank everyone for reaching out to me and my family, um, extending their condolences and well wishes. My grandmother passed away on Monday. Uh, she was 85, Ms. Rose, Mary Shiloh. And uh, just thank everyone for reaching out to me and my family. She was able to see her kids and grandkids and great grandkids. Um, saw us finish college and, and, and get married and, and live out a good live out our lives so um she was loved and would deeply be missing again just thank everyone who reached out to me and my family uh, this meeting is about kind of it's going to kind of continue to center around our continual conversation of criminal justice and we've been talking to the courts we've been talking to district attorney, different elected officials. Um, but I wanna talk to one, our children, the ones who are most affected by what's happening in our city and our schools, um, the people, the, the school leaders that spend the most time uh, with our children. At any given day, the school leaders may spend 10 to 12 hours with our children. So they have a lot of influence on our, on our young ones and also our mentors different groups that that do the, the hard work that that's much needed and also spend a lot of time with our, our children. So we're gonna get started. I know that Inspired NOLA is first on the agenda, but Mr. Benilla said that they may not be ready. So I see some kids, we're gonna do Inspire second. We're gonna do Inspire NOLA second. Um, Unless y'all ready to go first. Ms. Wa Dr. Washington. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. We'll definitely be going second. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're going to have the Silverback Society um, come on first. And I do see Mr. Lloyd Dennis um, of the Silverback Society. He is on. I know we're going to have a couple of other Silverback Society members join us. But Mr. Dennis, we'll start with you. I know you have a lot to say. We've had a lot of conversations in the past. So I'll, I'll let you have the floor. Basically, give us, you know, the background of Silverbacks. Myself, Mr. Mr. Councilman Green, I always speak highly of the Silverbacks. So let us know what it is that you do. What is that you see behind the scenes? Um, when it comes to tower children and services that they need. Let me also say this one thing. A lot of times we see the end product. We see the child after they've been arrested or, or when they commit a heinous crime, but we rarely see what creates this child um, and what goes into that child's life. So I would like to just get a sneak peek or, or, or peek behind the curtain uh, as to what events, uh, what circumstances create the end product we see, and maybe we could prevent those things from happening early, we could find out how to prevent the end product that we see on the news, getting arrested and this, that, and other. So without further ado, Mr. Lloyd Dennis, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I, I don't like to talk about crime. Crime is a, a symptom of, of, of a deeper problem. And the deeper problem is, is that children are not getting prepared for life. Uh, and I, and that's, that's based on 
a lot of things. Uh, we have generational, uh, you know, when you can describe poverty by, uh, by zip codes, what that means is that, that there's a group of people who are entrenched in a, in a culture that isn't, doesn't really serve them well. And so when you have children growing up without the benefit of uh, the resources of, of two parents uh, and the leadership of, uh, and re example of a capable, responsible male, little boys don't know what they're supposed to be. And we know it, We've, we run into them, we grab kids in eighth grade and, and they don't know what they're supposed to be. They don't know that they can be it. They have no examples in their life of it, of being a capable, responsible uh, man. And uh, they end up in a position coming out of 12 years of education where if they're not academically attuned, they literally can't earn a living. They don't know how to do anything. They don't know how to measure. They don't know how to nail. They don't know how to screw. They don't know what a Phillips screwdriver is. They don't know what a wrench is. And 30%, I, I looked up the statistics and it's like 66% of young people leaving high school are gonna go directly to college. And of those that go to college, uh, a full 30% are not gonna graduate. So we're looking at a massive percentage of young people in our communities who are literally left with nothing except some academic that they maybe didn't do as well as they could have because they didn't have leadership. And then they end up in a position where they need money. And society has taken away the, um, the, the little underground money that they used to be, get. they used to be able to sell some dope. Well, the, the community wisened up to crack, so crack's not not prevalent on the street anymore. And the drug stores and pain doctors sell the drugs or the opiates. So, you know, the, those, the drug addicts don't have to come on the street and these kids don't get opportunity to make that money. They also don't get an opportunity to, to make the money that they used to make selling weed. Because now weed is distributed by, by uh, Federal Express across the country. There's enough legalization where there are networks that have set up where if I want some weed, I call my friend in Colorado and American Express will get it to me the next day. So the kids are like in a position where, so the only way they can get something, everybody got to get this. Every, we have to understand that as a society, everybody has to get this. And if we don't make sure that children have a way to get this, they're going to come get ours. And that's all we see. We failed the children. If we want to solve, if we're really serious about doing something about what we call crime, we would focus on those, we focus on 12 year old boys, boys in eighth grade, because the science says that there's as much brain development between 12 and 15 as there is between three and five years old. See, we're not thinking about that. This is literally our last chance to help shape the way a child thinks. And it's not even hard. We found the Silverback Society, it's not even difficult. These kids don't know that they don't know. But the minute that they start finding out how much they don't know and, and what their possibilities are, they get on board. But if you wait until they're 15 or 16, the brain's hardwired. It's hard. It is hard to change the way that a 15 or 16 year old child thinks. 12 is easy. They're looking for somebody to help them figure it out at 12. It's natural, that's the way the human being is. So we, there's no money on the street for them to make. They don't know how to use tools. I asked a little girl one time, uh, I was talking about what, she said, how you made this? I said, well, it's a cup of this and a cup of that. And she said, what kind of cup? She had never seen a measuring cup in her life. She had never measured anything in her life. Little boys don't even know how to use a ruler. And what's the shame is, and, and this is not anger against any other group of people, but the Latino brothers come here, can't speak English, but can make a living because they, they know how to use tools. Some time ago, a long time ago in New Orleans, we decided that we were gonna try and educate all children to become academics. It's crazy. One th and I'm gonna say one third of, of, of the white people that I know make their money doing blue collar work. 
Some of them don't read that well. But they can put stuff together and take it apart. I had a brother working in my yard, building something from me, couldn't speak a, a word of English. But he measured and cut and built a beautiful deck. So what I'm saying to you is, we, if we're going to be serious about the children issue, we got to start investing in, at least in little boys in eighth grade, and make sure that somebody teaches them how to become a capable, responsible man, somebody that they trust. That's what we do in the Silverback Society. We were almost getting to be citywide before the pandemic. We were in 17 schools. We were turning out 600, 800 boys a year that had, had their mind right. I hope some of them show up. They got in the silverbacks in the audience and the kids, because they can tell you themselves. But this is not a crime problem. This is, we have not prepared children to make a living. And when they get, think about that, the high stress crimes that they are committing, they are robbing people. They didn't used to do that. They could stand on the corner and sell some dope if they didn't have the academic prowess. What I'm begging us as a city to do is in double down and invest. And if we do double down and invest six, seven years down the road, this is a whole different place. Peace and prosperity for all. But we cannot allow that, that, that half of the kids that's not going to go to college to walk out of high school not knowing how to do anything with their hands. Well, I, I, I don't know if I have much more to say. Uh, you, have, you have very qualified people. Uh, you have great educators here. And I don't think any of them will disagree with me. But what I'm saying is we have to retool education so that if a, when a kid gets to like 12 years old, he can decide whether I want to take this route or whether I want to go the route where when I get out of high school, I can earn a living. I worked at Rob Wayne High School. It was like the city's only vocational high school. It was literally a place where they sent kids where they thought the kids didn't have a future. But you know, all of those kids are working. Those kids are raising families. They got jobs. They knew how to use these with this. What makes human beings rule the world is not this. It's the fact that this works with this and we can change the world. We can create pyramids. We can climb mountains. Whales are much smarter than us. They have to learn more than us. They have longer lives and they, have a, they, 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 they live in the whole ocean. So they're smarter than us. And at least they understand that the most important thing in life is the preparation of the next generation. We think that there's other things important. We spend more on, on the NFL, on all the foolishness, than we do invest in our children. So if we're serious. We're going to call the, 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 the school board together. We're going to call these charter schools and say, what do you have for a 12-year-old that's not going to go to college? And as, I, don't, I don't know if I can be any clearer than that. And, and if I got a little emotional, forgive me, because I'm sick and tired of grown folk whining because they didn't prepare the children. So, Mr. Dennis, I want to segue real quick. Can you tell us what is it that the Silverbacks do specifically um, in the limited time we have the kids? Okay. What do what do we do to, to prepare our kids and any success stories that you can think of or share with us? We have a curriculum of seven lessons. It takes us seven weeks to teach. It. And then we hang out with the kids and, and other men come through and tell their stories about how they made it in life. And at, and at the beginning, the kids are like, <laughs> they like, they not, they not even have it. But while, when we finish, they figured some stuff out. They figured out that respect comes from being able to do things for your people, not what you do to people. They didn't know that. They didn't know that. See, we blame them for not knowing that. But they don't have a man in their life that can claim that space. Am I lying, y'all? Anybody? Am I lying? No, you're, you're not. You're not. You gotta get busy, y'all. I'm 71 years old. I'm getting to be a little frail. 
and, and I can't do what I used to do. But if there's anything that I can do to help change the way that we prepare our children for life, I'm, I'm down. I'm down. And if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. That's Greg. Greg. Uh, they called me up, Greg, told me to come. Please, my brother, I'm sorry I'm late. No problem, Greg. Uh, Mr. Dennis was just sharing with the Silverbacks uh, what's, what it is that we do. Would you like to add anything to that? So my frailty is the, the fact that I'm becoming more frail is why we, Greg Rattler Jr. is now the CEO of the Silverback Society. He's qualified and prepared to take us to the next level. And, and he, he can be a great asset to this effort to make sure that all the children, when they, they invest 12 years of their life in schools, man. And we can't be sure that they can come out and measure a piece of wood. Yeah. People come to the country, can't even speak the language, can make a better living than our kids. I'm, done. I'm sorry, Greg. The floor is yours, I'm sorry, but I didn't hear you. The floor is yours. Oh, so um, I'm, first of all, um, thank you for for giving us this opportunity. Um, as you know, the Silverback Society is um, an assembly of, of, of good men who've done well for themselves, who volunteer their time, treasure, and talent um, to train and prepare young boys for successful manhood. Um, we gather once a week in schools um, to try to shift these young men's perspective of what academic success is all about. Um, we make it cool, you know, to be academically successful. Um, I actually had that conversation with some young men um, at Heinz uh, Parkview this morning, um, talking to them about the choices that they're making, how it adds up to the outcomes that they experience in their lives down the line. So, um, you know, we use a curriculum um, that, you know, Bob Lloyd and Pastor Wildwork put together, um, designed around helping young men um, to understand that they have all the power to shape the lives that they want to see for themselves. Um, one of the activities that we did today, uh, we tell the young men to close their eyes, you know, stand in a, a strong position of parade rest, um, and we give them some prompts, and we, you know, ask them to allow those prompts to permeate their minds um, and to really just take ownership of what the feelings are. You know, we give them prompts like imagine themselves graduating from the high schools that they wanted to go to not just the high schools that will take them, right? And then we ask them to envision themselves graduating from the colleges that they wanted to go to, not just the colleges that will take them. We ask them to envision themselves, um, you know, moving into their first house, their first, their first homes. Think about their kids running and fighting over which room is gonna be theirs. You know, think about themselves taking their families on their nice vacation. And I specifically tell the young men, I don't care where you envision this vacation being, but if your mind can see you doing it, then your hands can bring it to bear. All you have to do is commit to yourself and focus on, on what you wanna do with your life. So uh, we try to make sure that the men who come stand before these boys um, are clear that we are only there to give our lessons, our experiences, um, our time, treasure and talent such that they can be the powerful upstanding men. And we let them know the first time we see these young men, we may be spending this time with you, but we're not here for you. We're here for the women and children who are gonna rely on you as their foundations of the future, right? So we are clear that the objectives of this is to make sure that these young boys grow into successful manhood and they're ready with the capacity to encounter any challenges that they face and any responsibilities that they create. Thank you, Mr. Rattler. Um, at that time, I will... Uh address, uh, take any questions from any colleagues. I see our Councilman Thomas just jumped on the call. Are there any questions for Mr. Dennis or Mr. Rattler? All right, seeing none. Well, I'm sorry, uh, Councilmember Morrell, hand is up. Yes, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I wanna ask some real specific questions. How are you doing, Mr. Dennis? I haven't seen you in a while. I'm doing good. Just get aging gracefully. Hopefully. <laughs> Hope I age as gracefully as you do. But 
I guess one of the questions we have as a council, as we're evaluating the programs that are currently available, it seems like, to your point, there is either right now the way funding goes for programs, especially programs we're trying to give kids an alternative path. It seems that a lot of the programs are limited to either, like you said, traditional high schools where it's, I want you to somehow, despite your socioeconomic background and lack of resources to suddenly become an academic, or it's, we're going to give you enough remedial education to graduate high school. And I think that I know this council has taken a position. We're really taking a deep dive at reevaluating what programs are out there and how they're being tooled towards kids. Because I will tell you that the way programs, I'm not talking about, obviously I'm not talking about y'all, I'm talking about this, the government run programs. The way these government programs are being run, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. And these programs are not impressing me as far as leading to alternative outcomes. It seems like groups like yours that are outside the box that are actually meeting kids where they're at to try and help them find a new path are far more effective than some of the programs we see out there right now, regardless of whether they're evidence-based or not, that seem to have these empirical principles, but they have no practical real-world application at all. And I kind of want to get your thoughts on that because I know, uh, and Mr. King will be on my meeting tomorrow, we're kind of going to start looking at some of these juvenile programs and seeing like what they actually are and what they're actually seeking to achieve. Because I'll tell you, in my experience dealing with you guys, with dealing with Son of a Saint, dealing with programs that actually go to young men who are on the cusp and helping them realize there's a different path, those are infinitely more effective than some of the programming that I've seen that's being offered, which really isn't meeting kids where they're at. It's kind of like, this is a cookie cutter solution that should work based upon some data we got from an organization out of Boston that said this data should work versus these are people in this community who have a renowned record of actually intervening with kids to get them where they need to be to help them realize they're better than what the path is they're going on. And I mean, we need people like y'all. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about what do you think about the existing programs? I know some of the kids y'all interact with, they've been in some of these programs before y'all got, 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 got to them. What's your opinion of those programs that are currently out there? They're, too, they're way too late. Well, you know, I started off my presentation with, 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 with the, the research that says that a 12-year-old still has three years of brain development. A 15-year-old is pretty much done. We start too late. Uh, you have to inspire children early on so that they have time to learn. Uh, the reason I'm here is because I had uncles and grandparents that taught me how to do everything. Before I left high school, I could, I, as a matter of fact, after Betsy, I prepared, I, I repaired my mom's house. You know, I, I can earn a living any place. We got kids who are condemned, condemned to not being able to do anything worthwhile if they don't go to college. Am I lying? You're not. I mean, that's, you're hundred percent on 12 it. years old, middle school, we had it right. Every kid who went to public school in New Orleans learned shop, home economics, something in middle school that opened their brains to the opportunities of, of adulthood using the hand-mind connection. There's nothing wrong with the hand. We let the academics convince us that you, it's better to make your living sitting in the office than building something or repairing something or shaping something in your community. We built the pyramids with these. This was involved. There wouldn't be no pyramids without these. Well, 12 years old. I want y'all, you're 100% right. And I mean, there's a direct correlation between what you're saying and when kids start to enter the juvenile justice system. Because these, kid, these kids get brought in at 12 years old. They get told that they get put in a system where it's not really equipped to put them on a different path or to give them all the incentives. And more importantly, like you're talking about, this, the, when you, that outreach y'all do, it's, 
it's sweat intensive, but it's not expensive. I mean, getting people, getting people to care, reach out to these kids, meet them where they're at, and really be role models. We don't have enough black men in this city that are stepping up to be role models to kids, to tell them there's other things you can do. There's other places you could be. You don't have to be what you think people tell you you have to be. You right. just got to be you. And that version of you, like you said, I really appreciate your, what y'all talk to kids about. Like, you need to look to your future. Like, someday you might want to have a family. You might want to have a house. When ki- the problem we have with kids right now is we don't give them a future. They live in the now, and the now is terrible. And when you don't have a future to work towards, and you don't give them the tools to work towards that future, there's no surprise they end up where they're at. I mean, the difference between a, a little black kid from Gentilly and a little white kid from Uptown is that they're told their whole lives, you have a wonderful future ahead of you. Here's the path to where you're going to be. And when a kid walks out their house in Gentilly or Lower Nine and their neighborhood don't like somebody else's neighborhood and the burnt out cars in the middle of the street, and they're seeing that their entire lives are being valued differently than other kids in the same city, all that stuff permeates every part of their being and puts them on a path. And it's like, if we don't, as a community, step up and let and give them the time and the resources they need to be successful, we cannot be surprised they end up where they end up. You all, you, y'all, y'all have been on this. So, I mean, I'm, I admit I'm preaching to the choir. Y'all have been on this and y'all have been at the forefront of this, but I want to continue this dialogue. I'm going to finish up, Mr. Ch- Mr. Chairman, but I want to continue this dialogue because as we look as to how we're going to change programming in the city to be more effective, like you said, we don't have enough programs with your kids how to work with their hands and tell them there's other things they could do. As we look at how we're going to retool programming in the city to meet kids where they are, we need you. And we need Silverback and groups like yours to help us meet kids where they're at and have better outcomes because we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't survive with anything less. So can I just, can I add one thing? Absolutely. Jamar McKinnon, give us, give us a tray in school, bro. Give us a tray in school, bro. You could do that. All you other, all you all the charter leaders, give us a tray in school, man. It'll be full. Y'all, y'all competing for students in the marketplace? Open a trade school. It'll be packed. You'll have a waiting list. All right. Okay. I'm going I'm, I'm to give it up my time. I know people are waiting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On, on that note, I'm going to put this on Jamar and let him talk about it later. We got, what, three empty schools in Algiers? Uh, one is an inspired Nova school, but I digress. Any other any other questions or comments from any board? Um, Councilmember Harris, then, then Council, I'm sorry, Councilmember Harris and Councilmember Thomas. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Dennis. I grew up uh, in a community that was rural, and that had trade schools. And I can tell you that some of my high school classmates made a good living and are making a better living than I am because they knew how, how to draft, how to do mechanics. And I too am an advocate for vocational schools because they actually work. Um, My questions are more practical. I know you said uh, we need to focus on uh, children around 12 years old. Is that the focus of your program, that age range? We did the research and and Greg Greg can write, we have have a PhD uh, at at Dr. Uh, Brian Turner. He, He does all of our evaluation work. We've done the research and the research says that there's as much brain development between 12 and 15 as there is between three and five years old. It is the last opportunity to impact the thought processes of a child. And those are the young men that your particular right. organization- we, start, we do eighth grade, we do okay. eighth grade. We don't do yeah. any work with, with, with kids that's already involved in the criminal justice system. You do not? No. That was my next question is, is there, do you have any focus? We are able to put five, four to five men with a group of 20 to 30 boys. So you can ask the numbers work one-on-one, especially with a kid that's already hurt somebody. He's got a target on his back, whether he's in the system or not. So even kids with maybe truancy issues, especially now, you don't deal with? Not if they're over 15, 16 years old. Okay. Um, And just as a practical matter, 
because I know people are watching, what's the best contact for people to get in touch with you to get their children involved in this? Well, the truth is they, their children need to be at one of our schools. Greg, I'm gonna let you do this because that's that's not my job no more. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but but you, you still you still know it, Bob. So, um, but yeah, like 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 Bob was saying, um, all of our participants um, are going to be eighth grade male students at our partner schools. Um, so that allows us to um, practice what we call all or none. We take all of the eighth grade boys as our participants, or none of them. Um, our program is not to be a reward or a punishment. We're really there to help these young men on their journey to successful manhood. So um, that's really the the method that we get a chance to really mentor our, our students. Are there any schools in District B that you work with? Um, let's see, we were at Savaney Williams College Prep. Okay. Um, we Green. were at Edgar Harney. Um, we're at Green too. Uh, Green Charter, we, we were at Green Charter Schools. So um, when I say were, um, it doesn't mean that the relationship has been terminated. It just means that probably for this school year, um, the school administration probably had a difficult time organizing their schedule to accommodate us um, because we only work in schools where we're invited. We don't try to barge our way in um, and force our way into the school. We make sure that we are a supplement um, and a support to the education environment um, for the young men. Do you, do you get any funding from the city right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. How, how much? I think last year was 25000 okay. And what's your total budget? That's the funny thing. Our total budget is less than three hundred thousand a year. And you service how many kids? For less than three hundred kids. That, that varies by the number of schools. When we, um, when so we before the pandemic, we were doing what, about six hundred kids a year. Yeah, yeah. Right, right now we have about four hundred. Uh, we got about eleven schools. Um, with one of our schools, we service the elementary, well, the eighth grade boys and the high school students. Well, thank you for all of your work. And, and Mr. Dennis, I'd love to talk more about vocational education with you at some point. There are a lot of men in community doing good work. Those coaches that show up at those parks, there are a lot of men who are doing things. We, we're a little more organized. And I think because I came out of the media a little more savvy in terms of how to get our message out. But there are a lot of men doing good work in community. We've actually partnered with 100 Black men and Son of a Saint so that we can share the knowledge base that we, are, that we have all developed in doing this work. Yeah, I was actually just getting ready to mention that and also want to lift up uh, the Region for the Stars Foundation. Um, the four of us, the four organizations, uh, we kind of put our heads together uh, to think about some progressive ways um, to really recruit, train, and retain high quality mentors such that regardless of what program a young man um, gains entree to, he still has access um, to high quality men who can pass good information and good knowledge on to him. So um, the opportunity to sit at the round table uh, that council member Thomas hosted, um, I'm really looking forward to the work um, that, that, that that body is gonna put together to really focus on a body of young men who is often underserved, but is sorely in need of resources and support. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you, Councilmember Harris. Councilmember Thomas. Thank you, uh, Chairman King. First of all, thank you for asking me to uh, come on this committee uh, or to join the committee. There's a whole lot of work to do, but uh, many of the men here, people that I work with already, 69% uh, of juvenile offenders are functionally illiterate. Uh, the age of 16 to 24 are underemployed, uh, uh, unemployed, even if they have skills to be employed. Uh, children, the poverty the level for children Post-Katrina is actually worse uh, than it was uh, pre-Katrina. And, and maybe it's, it's good that I'm here just to kind of share with uh, what's already happening. And there's already collaboration uh, with Greg and many of the mentoring groups already that started uh, last year. Uh, they really didn't need a push from us. Uh, there's already meetings uh, behind the scenes. Uh, you know, everything doesn't have to be public uh, when you're trying to work to bring people together. I think, Greg, we had about 12. Uh, men, young men, uh, sitting around the table, uh, attempting to collaborate and do some things to uh, bring accountability to those who deal with uh, youth services, as well as how do they, uh, uh, Chairman King, begin to collaborate and work together based on which each program uh, has to offer. And uh, uh, 
for those who uh, participated. I see some people are off the call now. Uh, for those who participated uh, in the last couple of criminal justice meetings, we had uh, Roosevelt Muhammad and Brother Hakim, who actually specialize in dealing with those kids that are adjudicated. Uh, he, most of the mentoring programs have, the, have their own expertise. So when the presentations that we gave in the last couple of meetings from Hakim uh, and from Brother Roosevelt talks about how do you get those kids uh, adjudicated through the Juvenile Justice Center and, and, uh, and through uh, uh, the juvenile uh, system to begin to deal with them, to give them the tools so there isn't recidivism, recidivism. And then, you know, Jamar McNeely doesn't always pat himself on the back. He probably had one of the most aggressive uh, mentoring outreach programs once a week for an hour a day uh, at his schools and, and inviting men and women uh, to come and at least spend an hour with his kids uh, uh, once a week before uh, COVID uh, happened. Uh, and, and of course, Greg and, and, uh, and Greg Ravy and, uh, you know, the men on this call. So a lot of these efforts have already started. So if there's anything that the city council or government can do is fund your efforts. Uh, we don't need to tell you how to do it. Uh, we don't need to tell you where to do it. And we don't need to tell you what to do, but to make sure that there are resources for that balance. If there's, it's gonna be lock them up on one side, Chairman King. There needs to be resources on the other side to intervene so we don't get to those folks who are just looking at uh, 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 lock them up. So if, if the funding agent for the city uh, can play any role at all, uh, it's working with uh, other potential funders and, and finding other resources to make sure you guys have the resources to do what you guys have to do. And then, then the last thing, uh, I'll speak for the black men on this call. The uh, black men are some of the most special people God put on this planet. Uh, and they're stepping up uh, every day, every time we've ever done a call uh, Jamar or uh, uh, Greg is standing room only uh, with black men. So uh, we all we can always use more, but for those men, man, who are stepping up in spite of and because of, uh, know that you're out there uh, making, you're not an afterthought. Uh, uh, you're not someone who's not doing what needs to be done in this community. Uh, we need all hands on deck uh, uh, right now, but especially for those black men, for those uh, black kids out there. Uh, thank y'all, because every time we've gotten together, there aren't enough chairs and there aren't enough seats. And uh, uh, let's keep working, man. Let's keep working behind the scenes so we don't have to make a scene. Thank you, Chairman King. Thank you. Um, no other hands. I'll just close by saying thank you, uh, Mr. Rattler and Mr. Dennis for all that you do. I want to say that I got recently got a call from a young man I mentored my first year in Silverbacks, and he was about to, to do something that could have caused himself and others harm. Uh, he said, Mr. King, you're the first person I called. Not his mom, not his daddy, but me from years ago. And I haven't seen this kid in years. So that just shows you the impact that, that the Silverbacks and other mentoring programs have. And, and lastly, I want to say, I was at the grocery store and this, this kid came, run, came running up to me and startled me. I'm like, he got a beard and I'm like, you know, I get in my defensive stance and he said, hey, I'm such and such from Silverback Society. You've been told me five years ago. I want to say thank you. And by this time he developed and he grew and everything. And he, he, didn't, he did not look like that eighth grader that I had five years earlier, but he still remembered me. And uh, he said, we sent them to Dookie Chase and he said, we never experienced anything like that. And had you all not put that time in with us to send us to Dookie Chase for that end of the year celebration, we wouldn't have known that what that felt like. So uh, again, that's just some words of encouragement to the Silverbacks, to other mentoring groups. Keep up the good work. Keep up the hard work. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you, my brother. All right. Uh, next up is, is uh, Inspire NOLA Schools. I'm led by Mr. Jamar McNeely and Dr. Washington. I'm, I'm very excited to have these uh, young men and women on because we finally get the chance to hear directly from our students, from our young children um, who are the most effective. And, and, and the council and the mayor and the police chief and the DA have all these, uh, these great ideas 
but none of us know what it's like to be a teenager in 2022 and to live with some of the issues that you all have to live with. So with that being said, I'll turn the mic over to Mr. Jamar McNeely, Dr. Washington, and our young, bright minds at Inspire Noah. First, Chairman King, I want to thank you for the opportunity for allowing us to be here today. Uh, we've been going through a lot over the last past weeks at one of our campuses, Edna Carr High School, uh, which has really not only transformed our minds once again, but have us in a really reflection point. We created a PowerPoint just to share some of our narrative, but also we have students and school leadership to talk as well. Uh, as you see, we live by a quote, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. In many cases, a lot of things that we're experiencing is due to the fact of our children having a lack of support, a lack of exposure, a lack of, lack of wraparound service to truly support our students holistically. Uh, and I'll get more into that uh, as we go through this presentation. I'm gonna start by giving a baseline on Inspire Nova Charter Schools that allow you to understand what our fight is, what we're currently doing in the city. And then we have a few requests that we would like to make to the council uh, as our students speak as well. Next slide, please. As you can see in Inspire NOLA, our mission is to transform and inspire educational movement. We believe that the students of New Orleans can do excellent things regardless of what school they're in, and it's our responsibility to actually do some great work. There's three core beliefs that we have, uh, which are inspiration, aspiration, and dedication. Uh, on the slide, if you can please go to the next portion as well. These are basically our core beliefs, inspiration, dedication, aspiration. Uh, we're gonna now talk about some of our performance and who we are, if we can go to the next slide. As you can see right now, we educate over 5,600 students daily in New Orleans. We're roughly touching around 13% of the students of New Orleans. We're the highest performing CMO in New Orleans and the state for open admission. Uh, we currently have the highest demand from parents to actually attend our schools. We're currently operating in eight schools. As you see, three of our high schools are definitely legacy schools in New Orleans, Edna Carr High School, McMain, 35, as well as we have five K-8s, Hart, Eisenhower, Cabdo, Wilson, and 42. Our graduation percentages for our seniors are 100%. We've been really active over the last couple of years as we've been doing rallies for students throughout New Orleans. We've had Sabrina Fulton, who is Trayvon Martin's mother. We had Tamika Farmer. Brianna Taylor's mother, Dr. Bernice King, who's the daughter of Martin Luther King, uh, Angela Yee, who's on a popular breakfast club, and recently Felonious Floyd, who was George Floyd's brother, to talk about advocacy, to talk about what we can do for our students. It's very interesting when we've had some of these national speakers, it's been very hard to get some of our local electives to actually come and be a part of these programs to actually rally for our students as well. What's interesting is our why, and that kind of what brings us to this conversation uh, today. Uh, this is a picture of our unity rally where we had McMain High School and Edna Carr High School come together to talk about ways that we can uh, end youth crime and youth violence, ways that we can support each other. Uh, we do thank Council Member Harris, Council Member King, uh, Council Member Thomas for attending our games to understand that as a community, as a system, as schools, we believe that we play a portion and it's important that we actively get involved to change the landscape. Our students organized this rally because they were tired of hearing the negative narrative that was going around our students around what our students was doing, whether it was carjackings, how our students were impacting the crime in New Orleans and currently what was the landscape. And it was very interesting from this picture, as we go to the next slide, our school at Nicar High School went from 24 hours of a unity rally to 24 hours when our youth was killed in the city of New Orleans. Uh, this is one of our juniors, uh, Kieran Ross, who was killed 24 hours after that game uh, by gun violence. Uh, the services will be this Saturday at our school, but it goes to show you when we fight in one end, 24 hours we're facing youth violence in our community. Next slide. And then another 48 hours, of course, we have a balloon release where our students are there, our students are seeing the trauma, our students are seeing the pain, and it's an unfortunate cycle that our youth constantly go through. Uh, we brought some of our students, as well as the school principal, before we get into our remaining slides, who are now going to speak just about what we're facing 
uh, how we're approaching this work and what's important. So if we can start with Dr. Washington, who is the leader of Edna Cora High School, then we'll actually go to two of our senior students that Dr. Washington uh, will introduce and make some comments, and then we'll go to some recommendations and suggestions that we're bringing forth. So Dr. Washington, if you can speak now with the students on just the urgency, just what we need and what we're experiencing. Absolutely, thank you so much. Uh, certainly uh, to um, our esteemed guests here, our leaders, thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak to you. I'm gonna be very brief because I really need you to hear from uh, my scholars who I have here uh, at the forefront of, of change. The biggest thing I can say, uh, going back to Mr. Dennis's comments, uh, is definitely reaching our young people right where they are, not having uh, any barriers or creating barriers to get to them. And sometimes that's gonna involve some unorthodox ways that uh, we may want to reach them both with their academics uh, as well as life skills. So some of the things that I know my young people deal with after being with them 10, 12 hours during the day is that what we do from eight to three just isn't enough. There is still education needed after 345. There's education needed on how to deal with everything from finances to handling arguments and disagreements to navigating the city. Our young people have bright ideas, great minds. They have the intellect and ability. However, they need the support to be steered in the right direction, to utilize what they have right where they are and not to have to fit any mold, but to make certain that what they already have within them is cultivated and developed to offer back to their community and their peers. Okay, and now I'm gonna introduce Maya Butler and Braxton Barrow. Maya Butler serves as a student leader, SGA leader here on Edna Carr's campus. She's also um, a activist in this city with both prayer as well as action with community service. Braxton Barrow is also a leader on the SGA. He's also instrumental in the community with local churches, uh, with music, as well as community service. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Braxton Barrow. And after Braxton, you will hear from Maya Butler. Real, real quick, before the students start, I would like their face to be the center of the attention on the screen. So can we take the slide off? I wanna make sure the kids get our undivided attention as this is the first time we hear directly from our youth. Thank you. Okay. Um, Scholar. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Braxton. All right. So good afternoon. My name is Braxton. Um, the past couple of years of attending this school and just being in the community, I feel that the city of New Orleans has failed us, has failed this generation completely. We aren't given the opportunity to express different things because of so many people telling us, no, we can't do that, or the possibility of that having opportunities to do those different things have been shut out. We are in my, I live in the Lower Ninth Ward. So in that area, it's constant violence. It's constant black on black, or I have to get you because I don't want you to have this different thing because I wasn't allowed that. Many of us have grown up without father figures. Myself, I have grown up without a father figure, father figure but I had those people who step in. We need those people who step in not just looking in. I need for the city council to understand that you can say all these different things and you can have all these different organizations, but if you're not getting in the mud with us and getting in the ground with us, then it's nothing. Faith without works is, is dead. We have in our community, a new elected pastor, Chuck Morris, who is over Thrive Nine. And 
with speaking to him and with seeing how he works, he takes the groups of black kids that don't have that, that opportunity to have those different things and are living in these drastic situations where they're forced and have no choice but to do the wrong things to get what they need. But he provides those different resources to us. So to I said to the city council, you have all these different opinions on what needs to be done. But my question to you, are you going to do it? We want to see the results of what you say you're going to do. Thank you. Hello, my name is Maya Butler. And one thing I want to bring up or touch on is that it's never too late. Um, I think what the Silverbacks is doing is amazing. Like hearing everything that y'all talked about was, it was really eye opening. Like I never knew that you guys did all of that. And it's nice to know that there are people in the community who do have the same mindset of a change needs to happen. Change needs to take place and that you guys are doing something about it. Um, it's, it's never too late to still give knowledge because a lot of, okay, so you guys said that, you know, you want to focus on the 12 year olds because at 15, their minds is already made up. Don't stop right there. Get someone who is willing to push through the minds of the 15 year olds, the 16 year olds, the 16 year olds all the way to 18 or whatever. Because at the end of the day, the reality is my group, the seniors right now, we about to go into the real world. And some of, some of the children, they don't know how to make a meal. They don't know how to measure, but it's not too late. You never want a child to feel as a, okay, we've given up on you. Don't just throw children to the side because it may seem as if it's too hard. Not saying that that is what you guys have done, but like Braxton said, the city of New Orleans has failed the youth. And, you know, with me personally, you know, like growing up, in middle school, I've always been told that being in the city of New Orleans, once you go to college, you are already behind. The, those children who are coming from other states are, that you will be in college classes with, they are already ahead of you. You will have to catch up. And to hear that is like, okay, so if I'm already behind, then like, it's, it's just confusing and it's, it's so stressful. Like having this meeting, I, it's so much. Take, take your time. Uh, we're not going anywhere. Take as much time as you need. But, but we, as adults and city leaders, need to hear this. So, doing a great job. While my meeting, I think it's important to note that our youth are in pain. Our youth are experiencing a lot of trauma. Our youth are experiencing a lot of unfortunate situations daily. Uh, we ask our youth all the time, how many of them have been victims, experienced, or witnessed some form of crime or aggression? And majority of our students in New Orleans system is going through this. And we're focusing on 12, 12 year olds. There has not been one year over the last 15 years I've been in education in New Orleans that I have not had to attend numerous students funerals. Well, we have not had to support families. We have not had to have funerals in our schools. Uh, we have a funeral in our schools study and that is not the norm. That is not what schools are supposed to be experiencing daily in a city, especially a city that we consider to be like New Orleans. And when we get into some of the recommendations it's important that you hear us because there are certain aspects of city leadership that we expect from you as individuals we elect in those positions. Uh, Maya, are you ready? Uh, yeah, uh, my apologies. Um, so it's, it can start in school because school is where you can reach children, but it shouldn't stop once school is over. So we have these resources, okay, you get people to mentor, you get people to mentor young men and young women. 
And then we also need something for outside of school. Now, I don't know a lot of the resources that they may have. They might have a lot, but the reality is not a lot of the youth knows about it. And we need people, like I told Mr. McNeely when I had a meeting with him, when we have those peace rallies, you don't need to invite the students like myself or others who get it, who understand that we need peace. You need to invite the students who are the troublemakers, who if you invited all of those students from one school, a fight might break out because those are the children that you need to reach. Because after school is over with, who, who do they have? We need people to reach the kids and not just just say we're gonna reach them, but to really sit there and like try to connect with the child because in the school you have certain teachers who just teach, they go home, they're like, okay, I'm done, I'm clocking out. But then you have teachers who are more than teachers who really sit there and help kids and just talk about outside life. And that helps children so much, like to just hear the children's mindset, like, when we would have certain meetings or you would have those rallies and then you see those elected officials leave, you will be surprised how many students notice that after the cameras are shut off, that those people leave. It would be students that you wouldn't even think are paying attention to that. And when we're in class, we make so many jokes about it, like the rally that we had with McMain. I understand the goal of it. But so many students before the game even started was like, this a rally about violence, this is not what that is. So many people saw that people who claim that that's what they wanted to do and people who claim that they were there for the youth leave. And to see you leave from a basketball game is much more than you leaving from a basketball game. It's you walking away from us. Because why, why did some people leave? Was it because of COVID? If that's the case, well, then none of the students should be in there. Like, what, what are the reasons why we aren't seeing the change or something happen with the youth? What is the reason behind it? Because the children of New Orleans, they're hurt. They're in pain. And I can't relate to all of the pain because I have a different lifestyle. But so many children are just hurting. So many children are depressed. The children in the city of New Orleans are numb to death. And no child at a young age should be numb to death. Me personally, I've only been to three funerals in my whole life. And that's only because they've either died from old age or they had some health issues. I have friends who have been to funerals back to back to back. And at this point, it's getting to the point where, dang, that person passed. It's nothing new. No child should feel like that. Um... And even the situation that happened with Kiran Ross and Tyrese is that that whole situation is crazy because I don't I don't know if it could have been prevented. I don't know if maybe someone if someone did reach out and help that child that their mindset would have changed. I don't know if that step was taken, but the, the violence and effect that it has on the youth is crazy. Now, I might not have a full out plan on what needs to be done, but I'm talking to people that do. I'm talking to people that know what needs to be done. I'm talking to people who have the resources, who have the connections. So what I'm asking you guys to do is to hear us out, but to also put this into effect. Let us see that you guys actually care and are not just showing up when something bad happens or you're not just showing up when the camera crew is here. Send somebody to actually reach out to the kids and not just to the young men or just to the young women, but kids of all ages, because at the end of the day, we need you. Everybody doesn't have those. Everybody doesn't have two parents. And even if they do, everybody not fit to be a parent, whether you got two people in the house or one, everybody, everybody, everybody ain't made to be a parent. So we need people to reach out to kids. And at the end of the day, you could give all these resources and children not take it. But what we're dealing with right now is that we have a lack of resources and children are reaching out, but you don't have that many resources to give. So we can't keep blaming the youth because I hear a lot of older people and they're like, oh, 
the youth always killing people. The youth is the resource. They're, they're, they're the problem. It's not the truth. Because at the end of the day, who's raising the youth? Everybody won't put everything on the youth, but somebody had to raise them. Somebody had to teach it to them. And there's so many things that play into effect with this. We could talk about gentrification. We could talk about all of these things. But us talking about this doesn't matter if there's no action being put into it. Because I don't want next year somebody else have to sit in the same seat and talk about the same thing. Like at the some at some point in time, something has to change. That's that's all I have. Thank y'all for your time. Thank you. King, can we go to some of the solutions before we answer the questions, if possible? Yes. So again with Dr. Washington, if we can look at the last slide, uh, some actionable items. One thing when we work with students every single day, we always challenge them with some standard expectations and some accountability. And I think accountability should be there not only for our students, but also our elected officials as we work this together. We understand that there's a lot of different ends that are pulling your time. We understand that there's a lot of different factors that you're trying to solve. We understand that there's a lot in the city of New Orleans, but we do believe that these are some actionable items that we can work together, whether it's through resources, whether it's through support, whether it's through us all coming together. So I'm waiting on the screen and we'll talk a little bit about those resources. I know the first one is inspirational stories. Just as Maya stressed, too often we find ourselves spending time on the negative. Uh, too often we don't come together as a collective to solve some of our issues and some of our problems. Too often we don't have, whether it's the mayor, the city council speaking directly to our youth on what we can accomplish together. When is that going to happen? When are we gonna have a round table where we're talking together on how we can solve some of the issues that are happening to our youth, especially in our schools. There's no other entity that have our students over 175 days a year, Monday through Friday, roughly 40 hours a week where students are in school. We have to find a collective means of how we can come together. If we could spend five hours talking about how we're gonna solve crime, I also challenge us to spend five hours on how we're going to prevent crime with our youth but we have not had that type of conversation with the same type of media publicity, the same type of urgency, the same type of awareness to understand how we're gonna protect our youth when we understand now that youth crime is on the rise. We need a group of leaders to show up with action. We need our city council members as electives, our school officials, our pastors to come together in conjunction with school leaders to provide support and advocacy. Maybe it's a town hall, Maybe it's a rally for our youth. Maybe we're coming up with a plan on how we support our mentoring programs, on how we're going to work as a collective unit. We're too separated where there's not one inspirational message that's telling our youth in the city of New Orleans that they can make it. When is the last time we heard the collective city council talk directly to the youth in New Orleans to say, young man, young lady, we're gonna change this city around and we're gonna make this a better city for you. As Maya stated, too many of our youth feel like the city of New Orleans does not show them love. Too many of our youth feel like they have to go away to college and graduate and not come back to New Orleans because they're going to be fearful of their life. We need a collective message or campaign to show our youth that New Orleans can be a positive place to them. A city that provides youth support services, whether it's Son of a Saint, whether it's Silverbacks, whether it's extended programs that's reaching our schools not only on a weekly basis, a summer basis, STEM NOLA, how are we supporting these programs to get them in our schools where we're touching not only the West Bank, but also to the Ninth Ward? Experiences and exposure. Why can't some of these activities over the summer be free? Our youth do not have the means to actually pay for certain things, but why can't they go on certain days to the aquarium for free? Why can't they go to museums for free? Why can't they be invited to city council to actually attend a meeting? I understand we're still virtual, but why can't they come be a part of that process to understand how things are going? Why can't they have internships from our city government? Why can't they be involved in a lot of different things and we should transition from a why to now that they can? We need a stronger NOR program, job opportunities for all. 
if the NARD program and parks are only going to be open during the daytimes when our students are in school, then what's the point? We need NARD to have more things than just athletics, which they do, but we need more opportunity. Positive stories. If you look at our local media, whether it's television, whether it's news, whether it's newspaper, how many times now are we seeing stories only about our Black males, our youth, being in the story, being in news stories when it comes to crime? We don't see nothing positive, whether it's how our students are excelling academically, whether it's how our students are performing in schools where extracurricular, there's nothing there that's showcasing how for our schools. Funding for supports in schools, I understand. There's a lot of campaigns out there for funding that's stretching all over the place. How we're going to utilize our dollars is extremely important to position our city that's really going to advocate for our students and our youth. As Maya and as Mr. Barrow stated, our youth are hurting each and every day. It's time for true leadership to stand up. A charge is being made to all of us, including myself, on how we're going to show up daily to affect our youth. I give you two stories that I'm faced with now. On Saturday, I mentioned that we have a funeral at our school. We had a press conference. One of the gentlemen at the press conference said, wow, Carr is a really nice school. I've never been on this side of campus. I've always been on the mortuary side. School should not be referred to as a mortuary, but every single year I'm having a funeral for one of our students in our school based on the fact of what's happening. That's number one. Number two, a young man came to us recently based on this unfortunate situation and numerous unfortunate situations. I asked the young man, sir, if we give you a part-time job paying you $15 an hour, will you stay out of this crime or would you just take the money and flip the money that we're giving? The young man stated directly to us, Mr. McNeely, the city of New Orleans don't love me. Why I'm gonna do right? If you give me money, I'm gonna flip it to survive because I can't do nothing else in the city of New Orleans. How do we survive? How do we solve those constant situations that even though this was one youth in one school, just imagine how many of our other youth are experiencing the same thing. So just as we're getting ready to rally for Mardi Gras and we're excited for Mardi Gras, why can't we have a campaign that's going to rally for our youth to have excellence? Why can't we rally around our youth to do something special for the city of New Orleans? Because New Orleans is a place that's going to love them back. Thank you, Councilman King, for our opportunity. We're here for questions. We also are here to actively work with the council uh, as in many ways as possible to transition and change what's currently happening. But last but not least, we need you. We need y'all to step up and support even more and be vocal as much as possible to really change the trajectory of what's happening in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. I, I noticed um, we also have students from, want to acknowledge from Rosenwald Academy watching. Can you all hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, they're not on the agenda, but I want to give them an opportunity to speak as well because all of our students are important and all their voices matter. So would you all have to say anything? Uh, yeah, it'd be great. And thank you so much for having us. Uh, my students who are all members of our student government have prepared some questions that they wanted to ask that are focused on the things that they're most interested in for themselves and their peers in their city. Jasper. Okay. Thank you. Okay. How y'all doing? My name is Jasmine. And so, yeah, I just wanted to talk and address some certain things about what's going on. So as y'all know, we all live in New Orleans. Every corner we turn is violence. Like it's only violence to me. It's like being black, you only get broadcasted for the negative things. Like I don't ever see anything that broadcasts us for being in a, like in a positive light. So, and I think that violence is coming from, well, we know it's coming from the teens, but I think it's coming because we don't have the, resources that we need. Like a lot of students that I know, they're actually really smart, but they're not up to bar. Every student is not the same and everybody doesn't learn the exact same way. Some of us, yeah, we might be on a road students. We might have scholarships, people emailing us about going to college, but what about the, what about the students who don't? Like they want to go to college too, but if they don't have the money or the funds to go to college, where would they be stuck? They'll be stuck in the streets trying to survive. 
it's literally nothing like it's nothing other to other to do except to survive literally so i think i think we need more like we need more media coverage about, about us doing positive things that will help us actually make it out because if it's just dependent on us it's going to continue to be negative because that's what they're taught honestly like y'all saying a lot of children they don't have that father figure in their life but some students actually do and just because they have the father figure in, your, in their life it don't mean that they're going to teach them positive because at the end of the day the father has to the father had to learn to survive too and if he ain't had it if he don't got it good like other people got it what he going to teach his son what the mama going to teach her daughter it's not always about oh, you need a dad in your life to make everything right. Because me, I didn't have a dad growing up. I had moms and a grandma. That's it. And I, even though I did make it to be as good as I am right now, that doesn't mean my cousins make any good to be as they are right now. They don't have dads. They had a mom. And my auntie, she held first child in the juvenile facility. And I am i don't know what to say, but I really feel like Stop focusing on the negative and turn the negative into positivity because without the without the positive without the positivity, we're not going to work. We're gonna be stuck in the same spot, not doing anything at all, but trying to trying to survive. With that being said, my question is: What are your plans for providing more after school programs and activities for the youth and ones? We're gonna we're gonna answer those questions um, after you all speak. So, so just keep keep going. Can you, can you repeat that question. Let me get it again. But we will address those questions once you all finish. Um, her question was, "What are your plans for providing more school, more after school programs and activities for the youth in New Orleans?" And um, how y'all doing? I'm sorry. My name is Gerald, by the way. Um, and I wanted to touch on some of the violence in New Orleans. And I was listening in on the Silverback and all the um, other programs that y'all were talking about. And I was actually in one of the programs. It's called Cure Violence. And I was thinking that, you know, Silverback sound a lot like a, one of the programs I was in. And Cure Violence was a, a type of program to not not reach to boys that were younger, but to reach the boys that are around my age. So we were like 16, 17. We had already been, you know, in this type of environment where we don't know what to do. And coming from where we were, that program did help us a lot. And it helped reduce a lot of the things that we got into. Some of us, you know, went on to go better and plan sports and do better in school off of these various, um, what is it called? All of these various, I'm trying to think of it like a course. And I just think that those things do help, but it's not just boys, you know, it's for like everyone. We want to like push this for everyone, for boys, girls, for everybody, because violence isn't only started by males, you know, and not, and males don't have everything to do with the violence. I know that we're more portrayed in the violence and in the media and in the news, every time you see a black boy on the news, he either killing somebody or be killed, you know? So I do think we need to touch more on the positivity and we need to touch more on what we can do to help boys like me, 18 year olds, 17 year olds like me to become better and to do better. And cause if we keep seeing negative, no matter how old we are, if we, still in school, we still seeing negative, we still being taught negative ways. That That's all we gonna do, that's all we know. And that's just how, that's how the way life is. If a, a kid ain't gonna learn and do, a kid, a kid isn't gonna do what he see, uh, what he uh, learns. He's gonna do what he sees. He's gonna learn the way he see, he ain't gonna do what he hears. He gonna do what he see. So uh, my question to y'all is, what are your plans to reduce violence in New Orleans? Like, what, what do you want to do moving forward? Because if we ain't moving forward, we're going to be stuck in the same spot forever at a standstill. Man. That's all I really have to say. Thank you. 
Great question. How you guys doing today? Um, I'm Jamie. And my name is Javante. And we want to talk about like, we don't want to talk about like what happened and how people became who they are. We want to get into like deep into the root and how we could prevent it, how we could all be prevented through, how do I say this? Like, like mental, like mental health, like crimes are not caused because people just want to do it. We have root causes to it and ways we could prevent it. Like mentally, people are different. Everyone's different mentally. You don't know what's going on in somebody else's head. It's always different from another person. And you can't go to everybody thinking they have the same mindset as somebody else because people was raised different. People, parents was raised different. And that's what we really need to start with the parents and like talking to the parents and sitting them down and having a conversation with them on how to raise a child in 2022. Cause it's way different from raising a child in 2012, 2010, the, the 1990s. Like raising a kid in 2022 is like a whole different ball game. You have to be there for them. You have to ask them are they okay daily because things change. People mental health change daily. Starting off as a freshman, I was 14 years old. I didn't know what depression was. I didn't know how to, but I knew that I, I knew that something wasn't right with me. I knew that somehow, some way, I wasn't like the other kids mentally. I wasn't always happy. I couldn't come to school and just think the brightest of things because things was going on mentally inside me that I didn't understand. So our kids need the kids need to understand their own feelings before they could even react or learn because they need to understand how they should react. And there's no like specific way, sorry, there's no specific way on how a kid should act based on their, their mental upbringing. I think so as well. And like to add on to what Jimmy said, I think that they need like more counselors and like more mental health programs in the school because that is like one of the main reasons teenagers are like resorting to crime. And we were talking about that in our social justice class today. We read articles about it like every day and we talk about like the police in New Orleans, all of that in class. And I feel like mental health, it really does have to do with crime because I don't think someone is just gonna go out there and do something like, I don't think that teenagers are really right in the head. And then when they try to go seek help from their parents, their parents are telling them they're not depressed, nothing's wrong with them because they have a roof and they have lights over their head. But a roof and having lights does not have nothing to do with that. And then when they go to seek help, it's you're seeking attention when these people actually need help, but no right. one wants to help them. And then they have some programs and these programs are only for young boys, young boys only. No one is worried about the girls. And I'm sick and tired of that. No, no one ever cares about them, no one. So, yeah. And our question that we want to say is how can youth and parents gain more access to mental health, mental health resources? Because that could go a long way into building a better foundation and making a better family structure because it's shown that dysfunctional families um, are like another root cause to like a lot of the crime in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, students. Uh, is that it for, Ro for Rosenwald Academy? Oh, no. Hi, I'm Mia. And my name is Shakur, and we wanted to talk about the environment condition that's in New Orleans. We feel like there's a lack of care and action towards the environment for New Orleans. Like, there's not a lot of awareness for the environmental stability and conditions that are in New Orleans right now. One main problem that New Orleans has is that there's always new buildings and gas stations and stores being created. While that means we have to cut down trees and lack of grass areas and habitats for animals being, being created. There's also a very high level of pollution, such as water, air, and light pollution in New Orleans, which causes animals and people to get sick and not be able to live their lives. There's also a, lack, a loss of wetlands and habitats for these animals. And if there, these habitats are being lost, this causes invasive species to enter other environments, which causes them to also become unstable. 
And I don't know if you're aware, but Louisiana is losing land. We're already under, we're already under on the sea level as is. And as we continue throughout the years, the sea level is becoming high and high for us, which eventually we won't be able to live in New Orleans because it will be underwater. And also we would like to know how will we want to live positive if NOLA will be gone in the next 50 years due to habitat and land loss. And there's also the low level of environment being able to restable itself. The more lower it gets, it won't able to restable itself, to restable itself. Um, it's like when you go around in certain neighborhoods, all you see is trash, you see stuff everywhere. Like where are the people who are trying to help? When I was in middle school, we had this program called Green Thumb Berman. It was from Berman. And we would go out and we would pick up the trash around the neighborhoods and we would like plant plants, like we help the environment like more and try to get everything back in this place so we can have better pollution and a better living environment around our school. It would help the students be more, hmm, what's the word? They would feel more at home and feel more comfortable around school instead of being around somewhere that's trashy. There's also a lack of care coming from people in New Orleans towards the environment. Everywhere you go, there's always somebody throwing trash into the water or on the ground. And it's not like they don't care. It's mostly like they don't know how the environment is being affected by this. And it's because school systems and people with power and influence aren't really telling them about how the environment is being affected by human interactions. So we would like to ask, what are your plans to address climate change and pollution in New Orleans? Uh, and that is all of our kids. Thank y'all uh, so much for, for listening. Thank you, Rosenwald Academy, Mr. Davis. So uh, that was a lot. That was pretty heavy. Good, great job, students. Um, we're going to have some questions and comments from our from the council. We're going to go with our, our council member Thomas, then council member Harris, followed by council member Morrell. Uh, first of all, thank you, Chairman uh, uh, King and the young people who participated. Uh, 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 I, I want the young people uh, to listen real close. Uh, I didn't plan on giving a, a civic lesson here, but uh, I think it's uh, I think it's important when you talk about social order. Uh, there's family, schools, and community, uh, church, and other organizations. Listen to me close, guys. Long before you get to municipal, state, or city government, when you talk about the system of schools, uh, there's a minimum foundation formula that funds schools. There's the Bessie Board, uh, local school boards. And now that we have the charter system, they're, bo they're boards that govern individual charter systems long before you get to municipal government. And listen close. School board budgets today, and, and y'all need to know this. Y'all need to know this. And so the, especially when we're talking about all hands on deck. School board budgets and educational system budgets now not only rival municipal governments, but uh, Chairman King, in many cases, they exceed. Uh, municipal governments, especially given the fact that municipal government, or, or what folk would call city governments, uh, have lost 25, 30, 40, 50 percent of federal funding in critical categories. So it, the, the question to me ought to be not who needs to do what, but how each of us combine those critical resources to do what is necessary or important to you. So I didn't plan on doing this, but I think I had to. How do schools begin to retool their curricula to meet the needs of the environment that they operate in right now? How do schools be plan to increase parental participation of those that want to participate, but it's difficult to participate if they're working based on the times? And how do they use touch point principles to get those parents that need to participate to understand that their involvement is critical. And then how do schools become not just schools that focus on education from the time they have that kid in the morning to the time that they go, but so that they're community schools. So maybe they mirror what happened in the late 90s and early 2000s, 
uh, when former Mayor Morrill and the city council had uh, agreements with schools that were next to parks so that those schools didn't close, so that those schools' gyms would stay open. So that tutoring, they didn't just rely on after school or tutoring programs to wait to get to the city council or the state legislature or our congressional people, but so that they partnered with nonprofits so that you could set up within those schools because those schools operated in the community and with uh, the community. So I think this is a time, you know, it, it, you know, there, there's so much uh, 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 who's, who's, who's responsible, who needs to do this. But for young folk, there are systems that you operate and you go to school directly under already. So the question, Chairman King, has to be, how do we combine all those resources and leverage all those professionals and leverage all those systems so that you can have the best product when you step out your house, when you step out of church, and when you step in and out of your school. Now, for the young man from the Lower Ninth Ward, we've had a system here uh, uh, since I've been involved in public office and just life called uh, shadowing. Uh, there are many young men and women who uh, got elected. They own their own businesses today. They're prominent people. You can call my office and talk to Darren Martin at 658-1050. Uh, we're gonna be offering shadowing uh, to uh, many kids throughout uh, the year. If you wanna get involved with what's happening in the Lower Ninth Ward in your community, 658-1050, uh, we'd be glad to partner with you about how you become an, an, an example uh, where you can show the other kids in the community where I grew up, I, I'm from the Lower Ninth. Andrew, between Villery and Urquhart, 1328, the house is still there. So please reach out. We, we'd love to have you work uh, with us, but this is all hands on deck. I think we heard from Brother Hakim the other day, uh, Greg and our round table where we had standing room only in the city co co uh, council conference the other day. Everybody wants to get involved, but we seem to have so many silos working that no one's coordinating where everybody can get involved with the common agenda. And I would hope we would start blaming this one and blaming that one and saying, who's this one? But what are the strengths and assets of each institution that's responsible for children? How we put all of those strengths and assets on the table and determine how we can collaborate around all those strengths and assets to come up with the best possible product. Now, I'll share, y'all shared stories with me. I'm gonna share a story with y'all. As host of the Good Morning Show, every year we commit to three or four roundtables a year in education. Mr. McNeely's been participating. He sent some of his kids so we could highlight them. But several years ago, uh, Cess 504, who was a, a famous record uh, uh, executive and rapper in his community, Percy Marshan, young African-American man who built a successful business, came on the show to talk about what New Orleans meant to them. And this part is for the, for the adults. It represents the history of this community. When I asked them, after we did the, the talk about them being involved in the community, I asked them, what did New Orleans mean to them or growing up in New Orleans? And this is what Cess 504 said. He said, every time we needed new equipment at the park, there was a question about money. Every time we went to school, there was a question about money for programs and they didn't have enough. Every time we asked for stuff in our community to help with the kids to do this or that, they said we didn't have enough resources. He said, but every time we got in trouble, they always had enough money. Lock us up, punish us, and discipline us. So the history of New Orleans is we've never had enough, we've never not had enough money to punish you. Rarely have we put together uh, our heads and our assets and our hearts to have enough money to resource you on the front end. Listen real close. Whenever you're in the midst of a blame game, we ought to be talking about the same game. And the same game ought to be using our politics, using our intellect, and using our souls to create the best environment for you, no matter what system we work in. God bless y'all. And I'll, I'll see you young man shadowing me uh, in my office and in the community. Chairman King, if I may, 
I, I just want to say, Councilman Thomas, uh, I do have some colleagues who are definitely looking forward to having that meeting where we all can come together to have solutions around what we can collectively do for our youth that we serve every single day. So it's a conversation we've been having on our end on how we bring resources to the table and how we collectively can come together with city official mentor and organization to really put our heads together to come out with one message on how we can work together going forward. Well, so, you're, the be you're the best at what you do because you do it the best way, Mr. McNeil. Uh, let's, let's just all get together and leverage those resources uh, across uh, uh, political lines and institutional lines so we can come up with a product that's sustainable. Chairman King, if there's a date that you and your uh, collective committee can develop, I promise you we'll have the mentor and organizations and school leaders there ready to work together. We're just ready for a date. Got it. We'll get with you, Mr. McNeely. Thank you. Um, Council member, thank you, Council member Thomas. Council member Harris. I just want to thank all of the young people for speaking up, but especially the young women. I agree that there is a, a, a rightful focus on young men, but we do need to focus on our young women who are increasingly um, in the criminal justice system. And I want you to know that um, Councilperson Moreno and I are talking about doing a young women's academy so that there's mentorship, there's learning, there's learning about leadership. And so please stay tuned for that. Um, Maya, especially, I'm hearing you, and Mia, Javante, Jasmine, all of you, I really thank you for lending your voices to this. Um, I do want to touch upon three issues, mental health and environmental factors. Councilman Thomas and I have spoken often about how environmental factors impact um, crime, impact growing up. And what I want to do in my district, in District B, is have a community cleanup day where we're engaging the schools, the churches, and other community organizations to actually set a date, a date aside to do community cleanup. I know that there was one scheduled um, for the Saturday that's being pushed, but I think this needs to be at least a quarterly focus because a healthy neighborhood, including not having trash anywhere, including having community gardens, is, is a place where you all deserve to grow up and that can really impact outcomes. So please stay tuned for that. On mental health services, I actually wanted to um, ask about mental health services because I understand the trauma that occurs every time you're seeing these killings, every time that you are witnessing this violence. And so what's being done in your schools, and we can have an offline conversation about what schools are providing. But I do want to call upon our community, our business leaders, all of the universities that we have in New Orleans that have counseling programs to reach out, to actually start to reach into the community and provide counseling services, not only for young people, but you're right, for their parents, to teach parents how to parent in this day and age of social media and all the craziness that's going on. So I've, I've made that call and I will continue to call for partnerships on that level. And I also wanna talk about good stories because I think that we're all lacking in positivity and we need those good stories and we especially need good stories about the leaders that you are. So if anyone wants to partner with me to do a social media takeover of, of my social media and we can put it on Instagram, um, Facebook, I don't do TikTok, but maybe somebody can show me how to TikTok. Um, we can do a, a social media takeover maybe once a month of telling good stories about you all because I do think it's important to highlight leaders, to highlight your stories, to highlight your achievements. And I, I agree with Councilman Thomas, we are too siloed in our systems. And hopefully city council or at least city government can break those silos so that we are able to provide mental health services, environmental cleanup um, projects, all of the things that you all are asking for. So I'm here for you and I'll, I'll put my uh, email in the chat if we can chat or it's just leslie, L-E-S-L-I dot Harris at NOLA dot gov. And everybody shoot me an email. And as far as the shadowing program, I think that that's important. And that's something that I will also institute in my office. So if anyone wants to shadow me and when we open city council back up, if y'all want to come visit, just let my office know and we'll organize that. Um, I know I'm not going to answer everything in the short time that we have. And I know that JP is going to talk about um, funding priorities and how we actually fund for outcomes. And that's something that I am also dedicated to doing, looking at programs in the city that the city runs and making sure that that money is not ill spent when there are private 
um, nonprofits who can actually use that money in a positive way. So I thank you all again for your time. Council member, uh, thank you, Council member Harris. Before I let Council member Morrell have the floor, I see Mr. Dennis with that. So uh, Council member Morrell, you, you don't mind, Mr. Dennis had his hand up. All, all, I, all I wanna do is, is assure the young lady that we have not forgotten about the girls. The year that we shut down, the year that the pandemic shut us down, we had our first uh, mentoring program for girls at Schaumburg and it worked and the girls enjoyed it. And it was girls learning from men. And it was kind of like the stuff your daddy would have taught you. And so we have not forgotten about the girls. We just had to figure out how to do it and, and make sure that we did something that was that was good. But, but we haven't forgotten about you, Don. It's just, we all learning as we build a boat. We're all learning as we build a boat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dennis. Council member, Council member Morrell. You're muted, you're muted. Okay, I'm not muted now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Leslie could not have given me a better handoff. That was literally like a baton being handed off. Uh, the second young man who spoke at Schaumburg, no, Rosenwald, can he come back up to the desk? The young man who was in cure? Honestly, I want to bring you back up because you're kind of a great example of what I want to say one thing to everybody who's on this call, especially the young people. In all my time in the legislature, whenever I was able to break through on issues that were important to young people, I was the author of the raise the age legislation that stopped letting DAs automatically prosecute 17 year old young people as adults. Every time we had success is because young people like yourself came to the Capitol to advocate because you guys are the best advocates for yourselves. Adults can never advocate as well as you can for yourselves. I want to bring you up because you're kind of an example of why I'm struggling with how services are being provided to young people. Cure worked and we have metric data showing that cure worked. Then they got rid of cure. And they had not really replaced it with anything like here. And as that program helped you, what was really troubling us, and that's why I brought you back up because you really are a great example of it. We're not creating programs based on what can help kids and what kids are saying helped us. That's just how this whole, all the programs we have in the city that we're going to fund. And let me tell you, what's really frustrating is funding is there. We have, we have departments two departments that are supposed to be helping children and young adults that have $4 million between the two of them. And they fund programs that are supposed to be helping y'all. And what I'm hearing, and I really, I really am going to take up all offers by all the school years about having round tables is that the programs we're providing aren't the programs y'all want or need. And part of the, the conversation we're about to have regarding all this funding that's gone out the door to these programs that are supposed to help y'all is that they're not being catered to what y'all need or what y'all want at all. And even the ones that are successful, like here, because I've heard nothing, I've heard nothing but good reviews from young men in particular I've spoken to that dealt with cure. They said that that actually kind of got me thinking a different way. And your testimony today saying that, I was in cure and cure helped me. I want y'all to know that when you're talking here, we're listening to y'all. We're listening to y'all. We're internalizing everything you're saying. We got a hearing tomorrow on juvenile recidivism programs and trying to fight it. The things you're saying today are going to influence this committee tomorrow because the things you're telling us about what you need, you need more resources like cure. You need mental health services. The things you need, we should be funding that. We should not be letting other people outside New Orleans tell us how to help y'all when y'all know what y'all need. And so I'm committing, I think the council has committed as a whole that we're going to engage with you, with your families, with school leaders and see what you need. And you could tell us, like you just said, cure work. I love to hear that because why did we get rid of cure? I don't know. No one can articulate it. But when you talk about mental health service, you talk about different opportunities. 
we need to be listening to you and your families because even y'all who aren't in trouble, who aren't doing dirt, you have friends who are, and you know what they need. You know better than us what they need. They don't need some weird computer program where they sign in. They don't need to be talked to by some think tank. You know what they need, and we need to be listening to y'all. So to answer your question on when you talked about Stop the Violence and about more resources, we are doing a bad job. The city of New Orleans is not doing a good job on providing resources that you need. The city of New Orleans is not doing a good job currently on anti-violence programs that you actually see working. The city of New Orleans is doing a terrible job on making sure you have connections to mental health services. These are all things we are supposed to do. I know as Councilmember Thomas said that the school board does have tremendous resources and I appreciate that, but that doesn't separate the fact that whatever resources we have, we should be using better and we're not. And what I commit to you is that the first thing we're gonna do is identify the money that we have to do programs to support y'all. And we are gonna take you up on your offer to work with you to where you're at because you're in the middle of this and figure out how we need to roll out these resources because you have to be part of the conversation. I mean, you have to be because the city is doing a terrible job of this right now. I mean, as y'all saw, y'all read the news, y'all saw what happened with the young man who was involved in the Costco carjacking. That young man touched the system 19 times between 12 and aging out of it. There were 19 times where somebody could have intervened to change his trajectory. There were 19 times where programs were given to him that were supposed to change that trajectory and nothing did. I'm saying that because I'm not saying that kid was a lost cause. What I'm saying is that the city failed him because we didn't have the right programs. We didn't have the right resources, the right mentor programs, the right mental health programs, the right support. Like y'all said, there's the assumption, I think it was the young man uh, from Inspire, your people, who said, there's this assumption that it's enough to put a kid back in their family and their home. What if the home's broken? Mm. The, the, the solution isn't always, well, you know, if we just give them some more money and go back home, it's all going to work out. That if there's a strong man or a strong woman or even a, a, a full family, it's going to work out. You got to go to the root of the issue. Sometimes... You need to work with schools to find out if the family unit is dysfunctional, you have to deal with that too. You can't just assume that kids are going to be okay because you're giving them resources. If when they're going home, they're not okay. But I know also on your pollution question, I 100% agree with you. Something that we've been dealing with for years is that there is historic pollution in the city of New Orleans, especially in certain neighborhoods in the city. And it absolutely affects people's psychology, physiology, and their outcomes. Absolutely. Lead paint in the city of New Orleans, especially in the lower Ninth Ward, Upper Ninth Ward, Gentilly, Uptown. These are all things that have been proven over time scientifically to put people in harm's way in the city and the state have done a poor job of actually looking out for people. We can't wait for the state to do it. I've done my best at that level. The city's going to have to step in, and we're going to have to work on that as well. But I'm going to yield my time now, Mr. Chairman. But what I want to say is this is the beginning of a conversation, and I want you all to know today your advocacy today, what you told us today, changes things. Like the hearing we have tomorrow and even the questions I was going to ask tomorrow, the conversations tomorrow about juvenile programming, what you said today has changed what we're going to do. And it's so important for y'all to continue to engage us because I will tell you in my, when we changed, when we changed the game at the state level, when it came to juvenile justice reform, it was driven by you, not by adults. You guys have a powerful voice. It is harder for adults to ignore engaged young adults than it is to ignore other adults. So I applaud your advocacy. Like Les, like uh, Councilmember Harris said, once once we're a little further along with COVID and y'all can be safe, I'm absolutely committed to do the shadowing program as well, as well as partner with the schools on more things. 
I absolutely need y'all to stay engaged. I work with school leaders to keep y'all engaged, but what you said today has already begun to change what we're going to do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Morrell. I want to say thank you to all of our students. Um, my phone has been buzzing saying great feedback. We need this because a lot of times, not most of the times, if not all of the times, adults like myself make decisions without talking to the ones most affected by the decisions that we make. And, and, and that's you, that's our students. So I want to say thank you for stepping up. I know it's not easy because I sometimes get kind of choked up and caught up on my words speaking in front of a, a large crowd and this will be aired all over the TVs, but you did a great job. So I want to say that as far as the media, none of us here are members of the media. So if they're listening, I, I would ask them to, to stop by Rosenwald, stop by Carr, stop by Landry, 35, McMain, the, the schools throughout our city with kids that, that's doing a great job. I see one young lady with, with an honor roll shirt on. Um, ha have her come to the, to the front, show us, show us your face, take that mask off. We, we need to see positive young black men and women doing things. Take, take, off your, take off your mask for a second. We want to see that, that beautiful smile with that on the road shirt on. Don't, don't, be, don't, be, don't be shamed. Don't be bashful. Um, but Mr. McNeely, um, you and I have, have already began to work on something for our children. They, they speak in loud and clear. They, need, they want resources. They want help. So on March the 7th, we are going to have a <laughs> they, they high five. Man. On March the 7th, we're going to have a, a youth forum at, at Nakar. We're inviting all of our district seats, schools, the seniors, and, and all of our schools throughout the city to show up. We will feed the kids. We're going to have presenters from our city to present to the children, followed by a, a job fair and slash career fair. We've invited Holy Cross, uh, Suno, our HBCUs, Delgado, um, all the schools to come over. If any, any, I know there's a, a labor shortage, so any, um, employer wants to come by and look at our young children that's about to finish high school. If any of our college recruits want to come by, any of our military recruits want to come by, this is open to every high school student in, in, um, in the city and any employer in the city that want to come by, please do. Because our children, like Council Member Morrell said, they're speaking and we're listening. And it's time for us to stop listening and start taking action. So I'm going to let Mr. Rattler have the floor for a second before we move on to our next presenter, Mr. Greg Ravy with Heroes in the Walls. Mr. Rattler. Uh, thank you for the time. Uh, real quickly, um, in response to uh, the points raised by the young leaders, um, the mentoring organizations that we mentioned, or, uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the Silverback Society, Son of a Saint, um, 100 Black Men, and the Region for Stars Foundation, um, we're putting our heads together to figure out how we as mentoring organizations can do our part even better, uh, better effectively use our resources, um, our human capital, which are our mentors, our strongest assets. Um, so on March 12th, um, we're going to be having a roundtable discussion. Um, we're inviting uh, public people who have interest in mentoring uh, to come out and have a conversation with us um, about how we can improve the field of mentoring as a whole. Um, to meet the needs of our young people, um, specifically to address some of the, 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 the issues um, that our young scholars raised earlier. So um, let's see, Saturday, March 12th, 2022, 11 o'clock a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Radiant Event Hall and Patio. That's 5800 Bullet Avenue. Um, you know, anybody who has any interest in, in mentoring, um, we're going to send a link uh, to the councilman's office. So anyone who wants to get uh, get that link and reach out to the councilman's office. Um, he'll send it directly to you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you to the young people. Thank you to the young people for being here. Yes, uh, Mr. McNeely. Then we're going to move to our next presenter. I just want to make one last important point. Uh, in our schools, every single day, whether it's the student, whether it's the teachers, whether it's the administrators, we believe faith and inspiration can move mountains. So I understand a lot of times we talk about resources, which means money. We talk about resources from programming. I don't want to lose our sight to we need a collective vision voice on how we can work together as leadership, period, 
to impact our communities, neighborhoods, and schools. We need leadership to stand up. We need electives to stand up. I can do better and stand it up to make sure that when we are speaking to our youth and speaking to our communities, we're giving our students inspiration and do this. And I don't wanna lose sight to that point because I know there's a lot of negativity that our youth always see and adults lose sight and lose the understanding that our youth need to hear that positive message constantly. And I just think it's important that we lead that way and we make sure it's there even before the resources actually come. We need hope and inspiration. Thank you. Well said, Mr. McNeely. Again, uh, children, youth, our, uh, scholars, thank you all for showing up. Thank you for the school leaders for taking time out of your day to have them here. Y'all did a great job. Thank you. Um, next up is a friend of mine, a, a person who's been putting a lot of hard work in behind the scenes for a long time throughout the city. Uh, Mr. Greg Ravy of Heroes of New Orleans. Mr. Mr. Ravy, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to everyone on the panel, the organizations, the schools. Uh, I'm so excited about this opportunity to speak before you guys. Uh, I just want to say, man, hats off to our students. Um, you know, we often talk individually with students a lot, but to hear the, to give them that microphone on this big stage, man, is just amazing. And I think we need to reach that microphone over to those kids, you know, a lot more than we're doing. Um, and so again, to those young adults, you know, congratulations. Um, I sent over a presentation, um, PowerPoint presentation. So if we can get that up, I'll jump right into it. I, we've been a while, so I'll try to get through it you know, fast as possible. Take, take your time. This is one thing we don't want to rush through. Okay, absolutely. And so, you know, I'll dive in, you know, while you guys get that going. Uh, our mission statement is my story. Right. So our mission statement is my story. So I'll share my I'll open up with my story so you can understand the mission. So, uh, again, my name is Greg Raven, the founder of Heroes and Northern Nonprofit Organization. Uh, I'm from the Fisher Projects. Right. Born and raised in the Fisher Project. I'm an Algerian through and through. I have a slight bias for Algiers, but we do do great work throughout the city. Um, and starting with my story, you know, coming from a single parent, uh, my dad died when I, at a very young age. Um, mom worked two jobs, you know, we better had an opportunity to see her a lot because she was working, providing for us, right? Um, and so going through this educational system, I understand that I'm a part of it, I'm a product of it. I always tell people that uh, I'm project subject 15, which meaning uh, I was a test subject that came from the project. And, you know, again, I'm still working to try to see how this book gonna end, okay? And so with that being said, you know, I was a part of the educational system we're talking about. You know, I went to Fisher, I went to Maura Henderson, I went to Berman, uh, and then I graduated from L.B. Landry. And, and, and in my educational experience, I was once was a, uh, I was in special education uh, for a while, um, you know, uh, and struggling, you know, in school and, you know, trying to find my way, um, you know, without mentors, you know, without uh, support and all these good things, man. And uh, I think one of the most important things for me as I sit here today as a founder of an organization, I'm a high school graduate, proud alumni of Albert Landry uh, High School, and also I'm a college graduate of Olivet College, where I just recently uh, went and received the award for alum most impactful young alumni of the year, saying that the accomplishment me and my team was able to do in such little time. And so I say all that to say that, you know, I understand, and this was created from experience, not from looking at it and saying that, Oh, this is needed. This is needed. I know when I what I wanted and what I needed at that age, and I understand exactly what those kids was talking about because I come from it, and it hasn't changed much. The poverty, Algiers don't look much different from when I came up and to now. The city don't look much different as well. And so, just to speak to the fact of Algiers, we actually had more when I was coming up. As I assess Algiers right now, as in its entirety, um, what do you have to do in Algiers as it relates to entertainment? Uh, we can look no further than Chuck E. Cheese. And then after Chuck E. Cheese, everything outside of that, whether it's movie theaters, aquariums, or you name it, it's outside of our city. And so it's very important that we work together and collaborate together uh, to be able to address these issues that our kids are dealing with. We often heard many people say, uh, you know, we have to work together. I, I said through the city council meetings every time these things came up, and we said we have to work together. But nobody is saying what they wouldn't offer, right? What they have to offer. Can you use, you know, my school for two weeks, uh, two days out of the week for three hours? 
right? Can I share my budget over with you because I know you're a struggling organization? A lot of times I say, don't focus just on the hot organizations, focus on the hot spot. You know, we hear a lot of son of us saying, and you know, those organizations are doing very great work that we're proud of because we're all in this together. But there's other organizations that I want to stop and pause and give, you know, credit to all those organizations that's out there, boots on the ground, in the mud, doing it as I'm trying to do it, with very little to no funding, right? Um, you know, we said now, if you can go to the next slide, and I'll jump right into it. Okay, we can go on to the next slide. That's my story. If you don't mind. Okay, thank you. And so this is where we set at in Algiers, where you know you see this, this arrow at. That's our address. And then we have again a 10,600 square foot facility. All right. If you can move on to the next slide. All right. And so in this hero building, you know, we're basing this more around a community center. Right, you know, there are things that's needed to keep kids locked in. There's a different way of mentoring now. I think we missed the point that it's no longer that you can just get a kid and give him a power talk, and then that's going to keep his attention, that's going to keep him engaged. Right? No, we need more than that. We need to give those kids access to things that they don't have. Right? Just because I don't have a PlayStation 5, don't mean I don't want to play. With it, right? And so, where's that access to that? Where do they go to get those personal needs met? Because we can't continue to deny ourselves, you know, basic needs that other kids have that we see other kids have. And so we tell ourselves these theories that we come under that, you know, hey, money don't grow on trees and, you know, you get it when you can afford it. No, nah, that's not fair. So, again, we have to understand from that standpoint that our kids deserve access to these things. Right. And so we have to work on getting those things. So this is some of the things that, you know, we're looking to, you know, add to our uh, community center as well. We can go to the uh, next slide. Okay, so here's a, fit, a few pictures of our facility. As you can see, we have, like I said, again, 10,600 square foot facility. We have a gymnasium, right? We have a conference room. We have a kitchen. We have an area for kids. Only thing we're missing is the support and funding of our city. We have opened these doors at a grand opening in 2018. And since 2018, we'll be doing everything in our power to keep these doors open, whether that's through our, our own pockets, whether that's through fundraising, or whether that's through just really knocking on a bunch of doors, getting the support of businesses. Um, you know, we have received very little, uh, you know, Harris grants and Cox grants. But again, you know, I understand I have a passion for this community. I love this community. My kids are in this community. My friends and family is in this community, is in, in this city. And so, again, I take it personal. I do everything in my power to keep these doors open. Um, and so here's a little bit about our uh, our facility. We do have classrooms as well, but you know, just to permit them. Not taking up too many space. This is just the, the big, the big part of it. So in the gym, you have we do allow free pay. We do uh, like to do movie nights when we give away popcorns and you know nachos and all that good stuff because we don't have a movie theater in Algiers, uh, right? We do have a conference room where we, we actively you know fundraising to add those computer labs to that conference room so we can address the issues of families and you know people who don't have internet and different things of that nature. We do have a play area for our younger kids. Uh, and I have a school program. Uh, we partner up with a bunch of North Parks. I'm a 78 year old basketball coach uh, of McDonald Park. I've been doing that for years. Uh, and so we partner up with Parks to say, hey, you know, bring those kids over here who's struggling, who's having issues. And again, you know, we have a meal program that we can provide for them and get them going. And again, here's just a you know picture of the front of the building. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, a community resource center for you. All right, you can go to the next slide. Okay, and so one of the most important things I think as we have this conversation, we always have this conversation of what we can do from the individual standpoint, right? And so you fix one problem and then the other end of the problem get worse. I think we have to all agree that we have a community issue, right? We are one community trying to service one kid, one family together, right? And right now, we don't have to guess if the city council is, is failing us. We don't have to guess if our school is failing us. All we have to do is look no further than the product that we provide. And after you go through our system and ask ourselves, are we proud of this product? Right? And so that's your, your checks and balances of what you're doing and also what you're not. OK? And so I'll go through real quick. Our Aspiring Heroes program is one of which we have at the summer program. It's a very successful program that we did in partnership uh, with youth and families. 
This program uh, allows us to provide a, a, stip a service provider fee to us and a stipend to uh, the kid. Why is this program is so powerful, right? The program is so powerful because it locks kids in. It gives them incentive to come get the information that we have. And in this program, what we do over at Heroes is we, are, we introduce kids to other heroes in the community to make them understand that it's possible. First, you have to believe it's possible, right? Before you can go out and do it. And so when I was in special ed, it wasn't, I didn't understand it was possible until I met my mentor that came from Tulane who told me it's not about what you know, it's about what you're not willing to learn, right? And so what we do in that program is we partner these kids up with very successful and prominent people. Mr. Freddie King was our lawyer representation. Um, Senator Gary Carter was a, a lawyer representation. Uh, we had players from the NFL. We had some from the NBA. Uh, we had carpenters. We brought all these people in and the kids told us what they wanted to be when they grew up. And we put them in front of those exact people to ask the questions. How much do you make? What it takes? What, it, what do I do when I when it get hard for me? Right? Because we have to have that. And so with that being said, that's a very program. And so the Heroes of, of Academy, you know, we're looking to work with high school, right? We're looking to focus on those students that's dropping out, right? That's a big population. That's a lot of our students are going out and committing those crimes, our students that's dropping out. So we want to connect them to the resources as well while putting those wraparound services uh, around them so that they can be successful, right? Everyone doesn't learn the same way. We all agree to already, but we're not given enough options. So if we say they don't learn the same way, why are we only giving one option, all right? And so that academy program is a great program. I'm currently working with uh, LB Landry School uh, with that one as well. Um, I want to jump into the Heroes of Heroes Elite, that work, uh, that work uh, development program. Uh, the work development program, I think, is huge because we talk about where's the workforce. And so we've been talking to New Orleans Hospitality and Tourism. We've been talking to Domino's. We've been talking to Waffle House. All these employees that uh, are looking for uh, looking for workers. And I keep telling them that we work with those kids in the summer. A lot of those kids are not being, not prepared. If we are business, we have to start investing in the work uh, that we want, right? In our workforce that we want. You have to invest in that. We prepare kids for a job. We currently have a program called Earn As You Learn, where those kids can be in school and also be able to get a job, right? But we're asking businesses to get more involved with the kids and their training, right? So they can get these jobs and they can understand what it takes to keep a job and to you know, keep a career. And so, you know, that's one of the things I wanted to focus on as well. Um, we can move on to the next slide. Okay, so the HEROES ID, the HEROES of New Orleans ID, you know, we talk about outcome-based, how we know your program is effective, how do we know it works, you know, what, what, what we need for our kids. And so this ID is the answer, right? This ID is what we're putting in place, uh, which we have in place is that we have access to that kid. Each kid in our program will receive this ID. What this ID does is give you access to our facilities, right? When you come to our facilities, I can tell you how long you was at my facility, what you did when you was at my facility, what programs you participated in my facility, how many times you used my mentoring program, how many times you used the feeding program, how many times you was recommended to go to a counselor. We have an understanding of what we need to do more of, right? And what we need to offer more to kids and what we can kind of pull back on and put in other directions, right? And so also with this card, again, as you can see, Domino's is one of our uh, sponsors on there. So we're working with Domino's to say, hey, we want you to help invest in this community. And so the kid who holds this card don't just hold a blank card, they hold value. They hold something to symbolize family, right? And so with this card, we talk to them about, hey, can you give them you know, 5% off of pizza one Tuesday, right? Uh, if they're doing great, you know, can you give them you know, a free pizza one day? just to show that, hey, man, you're doing a great job in that reward system. So, you know, we want businesses to come be a part of this, uh, what we're doing over here at Heroes of New Orleans. So that way, everybody's involved and you can see the outcome of what we're doing through this car. As you can see, we have a barcode scan and we have a QR scan. We also working with our uh, with NOPD. We do a lot of partnership with them. We want to increase that community policing uh, component. We have Heroes versus Superheroes basketball game. We have them to come in throughout the year and talk to our kids about first encounter with officers. Uh, all these programs through this card, you would have access to. Um, and so I know you're thinking, does this card have a cost? It's a $5 card, a cost for this card. But if you're an underserved kid, if you can't afford the kid, that's why we're fundraising. That's why we're out here raising money. Everyone who wants this card would get this card with no problem. And so again, we're real excited about this. We think that there are going to be a lot of kids 
to come aboard and participate and we can come see how we're working together, identify who we're working with and understand who has the resources. I always say, you know, the, the best community is the community where I know to get everything at. I know to go to get my gas. I know to go to get my food. I know to get my education. I know to go to get my workforce development. I know where to, I know where to go to get my funding. So again, once our kids know where to go, I think that we'll be a better, a better off and then the resources won't be so confusing. Uh, if we can move forward to that next slide. And so as we talk about, you know, just talk a little bit about the Peace Squares and to, uh, you know, working with those kids uh, who flunked out of school um, and giving them an opportunity. A lot of times you think that, you know, when kids drop out of school is because of educational purpose, right? I think that a kid shouldn't uh, be penalized for the situation that they're in that they didn't choose to be in, right? I can't pick my mom. I can't pick my dad. Right. But I get the punishment of having that mom and that dad. Right. And so with that being said, I think it's very important that we understand that and put those wraparound supports around those kids. I'm, I'm glad these kids came forward today and talked about the positive things that we're doing. But I also want to take a second to defend those parents as well. I had meetings, you know, this week talking to parents saying, you know, hey, dad, hey, coach, they call me coach. Hey, coach, um, you know, I need help with my son. You know, he's not bad yet, but he's going down that road. Coach, can you help me with him? And of course, my answer is yes, let's sign them up for the program. Let's get them an assessment. And so, but what I'm saying is that if I wasn't available, if I said no, right, that, that parent has no support. That parent has no help. And if that kid go out and do anything, he can't say she didn't try. So again, even when I was working off show, if one door was locked, we was trained to run to the next door. And we was trained to keep running to doors until we were able to get out of that, 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 that dangerous place. And so again, how many doors a parent gonna to have to run to before they have to sacrifice their child because the resources wasn't there, right? And while I'm on that subject, we work with young adult kids. My son is nine years old, right? And so we have to pay attention to this transitioning that's happening and understand why it happened. How can my son be nine years old playing basketball for eight, nine, 10 yards and I'm taking pictures and we going to Pelicans game and it's having a great time, right? And you mean to tell me only five years later, he's going to be toting a gun bigger than him. He's going to have, you have his first carjack and his first break in. What's happening, right, in that short amount of time that we're not paying attention to? How is that acceptable, right, as a community for our kids to make a transition without us, without our input, right? We're seeing kids, as you know, we're not too far from the car high school. We're seeing kids carjacking robbing, murdering, all that stuff taking place and our building can't even meet those needs because we have to be careful of how much light we use, how much air we use, how much this we use because we don't want to put ourselves out of business where we can't help anybody, right? And so I hear some people say, okay, well, you know, we know about some of us saying, we know about, you know, we for, we for, for, uh, you work for NOLA, but like I asked, I asked those people, okay, well, we on a certain budget and you want us to spend our budget on marketing or saving kids. You want me to choose between keeping my doors open for three days all right, until one day. And so with that being said, I think that we have a bigger problem that needs to be addressed, right? But first we have to start getting honest and realistic about what are we willing to sacrifice and give into our community, invest into our community. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. So as you can see, motivation, fear, all of these things is what goes through a kid's mind, right? And we have to assess those things so we can address the individual kid, right? I get so tired of us taking, for example, one of those classrooms and saying, those kids are bad. Those kids don't listen. Each individual kid have his own set of circumstances that he's dealing with, that he needs to unpack, that he needs support with, right? We have to make sure that we are handing these kids off to the right people. Right. Handing these kids off to the right people. OK, we can do a great job from uh, eight to twelve. And then if you don't have nothing for twelve then everything you did before that was a waste of time and money. Right. And so how do these programs connect? How do we ensure that our kids are going through a cycle to be a product of what we're doing? That's the most important thing I think that we're missing. We're missing. OK, cool. We, we helped him out until he was 12 years old. Now what is he done? Did we do enough to be able to say he can go on his own now? Okay, so that's one, that's one of those things. Then we have those people say, hey, my son is not that. My son is doing a great job. My son is doing good in school. 
We need to have something to offer that young man. We need to have something to give to that young man to keep him honest, to keep him engaged. There's resources in his community that he can be a part of. So we, we can't sit here like we can't do everything. We can't address all issues. Again, I've been a part of all these conversations. I've been a part of the police department, uh, the DA's office, um, you know, every, everyone we had, all those people had a need and one of them was funny. One of them was more people. I can only speak for my organization. Before, uh, the, before the pandemic, we had a lot of people who was willing to volunteer and jump in and pitch in and help. Now, economically, they just can't. Mathematically, they just can't be here and make money. Right? And so I always, I oftentimes get the question, and it always gets me because I have people in certain positions, right? And they'll say, Greg, right, what do you need? And I, I, I say to them, the same thing you have, the same thing you need, the same thing a prison need. I need the same thing a prison need. I need funding. I need counselors. I need space. I need programs, funded programs. Right? I keep saying, you know, the, the, the sink is overflowing, but we're running to get a mop to clean the water off the floor without shutting off the valve. How long are we going to mop the floor and let the sink run over? How long the end solution is going to be? Well, all the resources in the police department and in the jails. But then we're going to go back and say, why our kids can't get jobs? Why are our kids have records? Why are our kids are doing this? Because here's the other point, and I don't condone any violence, so I wouldn't do what I do. Right. But I want us to understand that we talk about young black men, but we are losing them at an alarming rate. And so all these single parents that we're dealing with now, because the problem that we're dealing with now is what we didn't do four or five years ago. And this is the result of that. problem. And if we don't do nothing now, we'll be dealing with this problem four or five years ago. And those kids who are not getting attention will affect those kids and families who's not involved in what's going on. OK, and so we have to ask ourselves when we are going to address the problem so we can stop it and jump in the middle, okay? So we can go to, uh, to the next slide. So again, this is just some things that, you know, we have to understand that, you know, our youth needs. It's not a want, it's a need for them to be successful. You say, okay, well, how do you, you know, measure success? What do you need in this community for our kids to be successful? These are some of the topics that we have to cover. These are some of the things that they're need. The needs are, okay, next slide. Okay, and so we have made it a point over at Heroes and Nuance. We understand that we can't do it by ourselves. We don't have the capacity. We don't have the funding. We just can't. And so many of you on this slide have worked with us before in some capacity. We have worked with uh, churches, Marine Bible Church, Rock of Ages Baptist Church. We have worked with the police department. They know who we are. We have worked with Second Harvest. We have worked with politicians, you know, and many of them know who we are. We have worked with other organizations, right? We have made sure we made every phone call, colleges for volunteers, to say, how do we provide the full circle of resources for our kids and our community? Because I cannot go home and tell my son, I had a bad day, you can't eat tonight. He doesn't understand that. So we cannot continue to keep telling our kids, we're going to take care of your younger brother and sister because we can't take care of the problem that you're facing now. That's not fair. And that's why they go out here and they act like nobody cares about them. And they're out here alone, so their actions only affect them. And like I tell them, I have never been to an empty funeral. Someone cares about you. I care about you. We care about you. But that's the only words. We have to show it collectively as a city. Okay? And so one of our biggest things is saying that we can't fix this problem. We can't address these issues now. We can't save that lady's son who's potentially about to get murdered or get hurt. Let's not tell them, okay, we're going to have these funerals. No, let's jump in there and say, okay, we're going to, man, I'm going to assure you, I'm going to do everything in my power to save your son. All right, and so we can go to the next slide. So, all right, so the next slide, just again, I, I, I'll go over it. We're just talking about some of the things to keep our youth attention, some suggestions. 
right? We know working is a big one, right? They need what we need. We go to work every day for money. They need money. They like nice things too. It is a hard time to be a teenager right now because when I went to school with a hole in my shoe, when I was coming up, only my school saw it. Now, if I go to hole in school with my shoe, they're going to post it. It's going to go viral and everybody going to see it. So again, if you either give them, my uncles always say, don't ever tell somebody how to stop making money. You're going to tell them how to start. So we want to stop these kids from breaking in cars for money, right? Or to sell things to get money, right? We have to give them another means of income and, and show them how to work with money, how to invest money, how to save money. Because there's no one on this screen who don't need a paycheck or who's not paying a bill unless they're one of our students. But they like nice things too. And we're living in a tough economy in a poverty area that a lot of times when I grew up, hey, give me a quarter and a quarter won't get it to dig. So let's find opportunities for them to make their own money so they can feel good about themselves. So they can go out into the world, into the community saying, hey, I built this up from a summer job or from scratch. And we have to be able to reach more kids. Most of our programs only would take, whether it's PAN programs through NOT, a certain amount of kids. We are on average, again, and I'm just throwing this number out there, we got to be averaging anywhere from eight to 15 kids, maybe you going to jail per day. So we have more kids going to jail than they have opportunities in their community. You, we don't think that sooner or later that's going to offset and we're going to see these single parents. We're going to see these kids coming up with no dads because now you have, whereas until the law been increased, whereas until you're going to do eight, 15 years for going into a car or for armed robbery. These things, these things are serious. And I'm not saying that I'm condoning that again. What I'm saying is that we got to get on the preventative side so these young men don't make that mistake that they can't come back from in eight years. Five years. That is a long time to be institutionalized, then come back out on the street and say, okay, well, I need you to get back in line with society and understand this. Now nah, that, that I don't I don't think that's fair. And so we can go to the next slide. You can go one more slide over. Okay, so these are some of the things that I think is very important, you know, through our summer program and, and some of these things we're, we're in communication with, uh, getting these partnerships sealed so that way we can offer these services uh, to kids. I think that, you know, one of my sayings to my kids is you're only good as your options. If you only got one car, all you're going to drive is one car. If drugs is the only thing you see, you're going to sell drugs. A big percentage of our kids want to do play basketball or football because there's no hockey ring, right? There's no hockey arena, right? Or there's no active, you know, baseball field. So I go with the two options I have. But we expect more out of them when we say, hey, we're going to tell the kid, hey, everybody going to go to the NBA. So what should I be doing? What other things are out there? How much do they pay? Where are they at? How do I get involved in it? Don't tell me. And that's why all of our kids work so hard to get to the NBA and fall short and don't know how to don't know what to do with themselves because I was one of those kids. I put everything I had into basketball. I see friends that did it as well. But I, I can't tell you what can I go get those other opportunities from that people talk about. And so here are some of those, those, those opportunities we want to present to our community. All right. Next slide. So we all know, you know, five points. Framework. Prevention, intervention and support, enforcement, partnership and advocacy, community accountability. All those things mean nothing without the people to enforce them and be a part of them. They're just words on the paper. We can't all keep jumping up when it's a funeral or when it's a, a balloon release or when the kid gets shot or when my car got broken into. We have to get together and enforce these things now. The framework has to be established right now. We can go to the next slide. And so again, we talk about that handoff process. You know, how do we move up the charts, right? What are we doing with those younger kids? You know, tech opportunities. Tech is a big thing. Game and code and cryptocurrency. Metaverse. Our kids should have access to those things. So we partnered up with IGL to be able to provide those services. Because we know our kids need access to it. Just a few minutes ago, we heard our kids say, we are so far behind. 
When we got to college, we were behind. When are we going to listen to them and say, okay, well, cool, let's start incorporating some of these things in our school that's happening now financially because the world is just not geared about just only getting a job. Some of our most successful people out there are entrepreneurs. They entrepreneurs, right? And so we need to start pushing that so we can start, we say support black businesses, but we are not teaching how to grow black businesses. We have more black businesses involved in pop-up shops. We have a ton of space in uh, space in LJs and throughout the city, but we can be encouraging our students to know how to get an LLC, insurance and occupational license and you know be able to do their taxes. And we can build business leaders now, right now, okay? And so with that being said, uh, that conclude, next slide will conclude uh, my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Ravy. At this time, are there any comments or questions from any council members? I don't see any, but I do have a couple of questions, Mr. Ravy. And none? Okay. How much, I'm sorry, Councilmember Harris. Uh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Harris, followed by Councilmember Morrell. And then I'll bring in the rear. Councilmember Harris. Uh, thank you. And Council Member Morrell, sorry, I think you had your hand up first, but I have a quick question about partnerships. Um, one of the things that I've been interested in is uh, partnerships with tech companies, because we have a lot of tech companies here in New Orleans um, and companies that are actually coming to New Orleans. Um, we heard a presentation from uh, one of the business councils that we have one of the highest involvements of Black folks and women in tech. And so I wondered if you have any current partnerships with any tech companies who are helping to fund these efforts. We don't have any partnership with any tech companies that's looking to fund our efforts. But again, we are working with IGL Foundation, um, which Ms. Kimberly Thomas is the president of that. And uh, through that partnership, uh, we award a lot of resources to kind of get our kids introduced to uh, technology. Um, and so again, but we are you know, actively looking for a partnership that would allow us to bring some of those tech opportunities here. Okay, well, I will, as I speak to them, because I plan on speaking to all of them to try to figure out opportunities and partnerships, I will keep you in the loop. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Councilman. Councilmember Morrell. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's good seeing you again, Mr. Ravi. Uh, following up on, on uh, Council Member Harris's question, I know that there are this is a significant presence in the city by both Google and Microsoft. Mm -hmm. I am I've been able to partner in particular Electronic Arts and Microsoft previously into similar programs. Let's meet offline. There's a lot of interest there. I mean, with, with a lot of these groups, what I appreciate on the beginning of your slide, your presentation, you had very specific requests as far as what you absolutely need to bring this your program to the next level. And I know with Microsoft in particular, they're very responsive when you have it, especially when it comes to equipment. A lot of these companies, they are much more reticent to get involved in cash as far as like obligating themselves to a series mm -hmm. of donations, but because mm -hmm of the economy and scale and the fact that they have so much so much access to equipment, mm -hmm. they are always typically very, mm -hmm. very helpful when it comes towards linking with groups like yours yep. to get equipment, especially when it comes to monitors, computers, even with Microsoft with gaming systems, they're pretty responsive. Let's uh, I talk to James Baker, I'm off as he's going to reach out to you. I think you know James already. Yep. And so James is going to reach out to you and see what we can do on that. I'll work with Councilmember Harris. Like, I mean, the fact that I've, I've met with Kalisha before in IGL, and I think that there's a lot we can do there as a council, working with a lot of our legislative partners to really get more synergy. Because as you know, three of the largest, three subsidiaries of the largest gaming companies in the world are all in New Orleans already. Mm -hmm. And they don't have as substantial a partnership with IGL as they should. And I think maybe working with you and IGL, we can all work together. Because I, I agree with you. I mean, there are kids right now across the country who are making more money 
and more likely be successful getting into esports than real sports. And having the ability with a program like yours to couple those kids in there together. Because the difference is this: if you if you want to be if you want to be an NBA player and you learn the fundamentals of basketball, it's 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 like it's a it's NBA or bust. Because mm-hmm. the fundamentals of basketball, it doesn't lend itself to necessarily you turn that into a career. Mm-hmm. What I have seen in my time in the legislature is that when you get kids engaged in particular with video games, you can get them engaged in the fundamentals of coding. Yep. And once you get engaged in, but with coding and technology, that does lend itself to growing into an actual career or curriculum where you can make them competitive in a variety of fields. I mean, the lack of the lack, the only thing that limits our growth in, in New Orleans, as far as our tech fields, is that we don't have enough people who can do programming and code in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. So part of what limits the growth of the companies that flock here is that they flock here. And then we don't have the inherent base of particularly high school and college students who have an aptitude for those kind of technologies. Because when you talk to some of these guys, especially the guys I've talked to, there's a senior VP of Google who lives in, uh, in New Orleans. And they say, listen, we'd love to grow our office here, but it's not economical to train somebody somewhere else, fly them here and grow them here. If you, I mean, when DXC, which is one of the largest companies in the world that is on Poydras right now moved here, part of the incentive package the state had to negotiate was to give them $5 million to go to UNO to train people in tech to work for them because we didn't have the workforce for them. So I would love to partner with you. I've, I've, I know I've had some conversations with the board at Sci High as well and trying to figure out how we can bundle this all together, but you would be a great pipeline for getting these kids into really high paying jobs by getting them engaged, especially the younger, like you said, those, the younger from 12 up, getting them engaged on what they already like and showing them you could do what you like for a living. You could Absolutely. be in video games and technology for a living, make really good money and not just have a good living here, but have opportunity across the entire world. Cause we have companies here that can incubate you as a high school student and as a college student that have offices in other countries that they'll move you to. So mm-hmm. I want to follow up. James is going to reach out to you as far as setting that up. And we're going to really work. I'm going to work with council member Harris as well, but we're going to work to get to really get you with companies to have some significant partnerships. And like I said, I'm gonna, if you could send my office that slide on equipment in particular, uh-huh. it would give us a, a head start on trying to find out partners we can have to deal with the equipment piece. Because that is, in my experience, that's actually the easier thing to do is go get equipment than it is money at this point. Right. And I'll say thank you so much for that. Uh, you're absolutely right. But equipment is one of the more important things because although you can find some college kids that may need some volunteer hours, they don't come with the equipment as well. So I always say, you know, it's it's not all about, you know, the money aspect of it, because if you can save us money, right, uh, and we can touch another area in our program by getting that equipment, um, that helps us out as well. So we're open to all, you know, in-kind donations. So I appreciate that. Okay. Well, I look forward to working with you. I'm going to yield my time to whoever else is next, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Member Morrell. Um, I don't see any other raised hands, so I will give some questions and comments. <clears throat> First of all, thank you for, for your presentation, uh, Mr. Mr. Ravy. I'm glad you mentioned something earlier, and it's the same thing that our children from Algiers stated. There is nothing for a child to do in Algiers. Now, I'm not talking about NARD because we all know after a certain age, a child kind of naturally phases out of NARD. That's around that 13, 14 year old. Some children just have no interest in recreations at all. Um, but there is nothing for our children in Algiers. And, and um, I know I could speak for Council Member Morrell who walked the, the streets of Algiers with me and he pointed out himself that the city needs to do something about the lack of entertainment for children. So um, I ask that all the council members listening, all of the uh, administration is listening, um, listen to these children, listen to the people who work close with our children, that there is nothing for a child or very little for a child, for a young adult to do in Algiers. 
So when they commit crimes, what other option do you give them? So that's that's my my first comment. For the children that's still listening, um, I think that you all, the, the youngest may be 14 or 15, which means by the next election cycle, you all will be of age to vote. So if you don't like the, the representation and leadership now, cash your vote, make your vote heard. Mr. Dennis, I don't know if he still has it, had this big sign on the side of his house, on the side of his fence saying, paraphrase it, your vote counts. So we need to encourage all of our young children, get out of that mindset of my vote doesn't count, I'm too young. You might be 15 now, but in three years, before the next, before the next election cycle, you'll be 18. And just like you can use social media to communicate other stuff, rally your friends and say, look, we want a thousand signatures guaranteed to vote. And I guarantee you show any elected official a thousand voters, your voice becomes that much louder. So keep that in mind when it's time to, uh, to vote. And maybe you all have some kind of voter registration event at your school. And Mr. Ravy, if you can, how much money do you receive from the city? So uh, as it relates to the city, we have received $26,593 over the course of three years. Three years. And, and my and so, wife is the math person. That's 12000 a year, roughly. Right. And then some of which that money, like I said, we participated in the um, summer success program. We actually paid out of this, paid out to our youth as stipends. Um, for their participation, and then when it was changed over, then they uh, job one provided the stipends to our family using family partnership, um, and that's pretty much how it you know how it went. But that program and that funding comes in at um, a summer portion, which is about maybe a five week program. And so you know once that five week happens, you know, after that we're busting our behind and scrambling. It's cool. And you understand this is full fundraising mode, and you know we selling suppers and we doing this just to keep our so you you have to do all you do with our children and then sell fish plates mm -hmm, to make it to, to to continue and and our uh, councilman morell is often beating the drum about who are getting what organization is, is getting these dollars do we give them to the ones that need it do we give it to the ones that's most politically connected or do we give it to the ones that's really doing the work? And unfortunately, it seems like the ones that's doing the work, or at least in your instance, are getting the, it's getting the short end of the stick. So I would like for all of those listening in the business community, the elected officials to listen, that you all need funds. You know, mm -hmm. as, simple, as simple as that. How yeah. we get on, you need, you need funds. This it, it, it can't be done you know, on thank yous and, and I appreciate it. So that's all I had for my questions and comments. Mr. Mr. Dennis, your hand is, is raised. I, I just want to say to all the people on the city council, y'all need to take care of this, man. Y'all need to take care of this program. This needs to be robustly funded by the city. One of the issues I had with the Kellogg Foundation, and I, and I made myself very clean, clear with them, is they came to New Orleans with a massive amount of money, something like $3 million, and they put it in the hands of city government. And, I'm and I told them, and you know, and all of you are elected officials, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but y'all know y'all are flavor of the week. You know, and, and when y'all changed, they talked about what happened to the CURE program. What happened to the CURE program was the administration changed. And few administrations pick up and run programs that they, that, that they predecessor. So I'm suggesting to the council, and, and I, like, I, I, I like hearing what JP is talking about, is that let's, let's get the city in the business of collecting revenues, finding people in community that are doing the work, that, 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 that are credible, and let's make sure that that money that we have to do to you, to serve you, doesn't change every election cycle, and you can support the nonprofits the nonprofits are people that, that, that have been in the, in the trenches. And I, Greg, I didn't even know about your place. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that is a great thing. On, on, and, and so see that ability to just hang out. I know nobody probably can't put that in a funding thing and say, we, kids need a place to hang out. 
Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, but, but my point is, is kids need a place to hang out yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and to be with other kids who want to do the right thing. And I'm, I'm going to beg everybody on the city council, mm-hmm. everybody that, that can hear me, make sure that this man gets at least $100,000 so that he can full flesh this. We, we can real send silver backs over there. He's, he's done a lot on his own. They have done enough on their own with their own blood and sweat and tears to deserve municipal funding. And when they get the municipal funding, then the, then the uh, foundation community is going to look at them differently and they're going to be able to get more from them. So uh, we, we'd appreciate, we appreciate a little something, something. Greg, Greg could probably say the same thing as me. Uh, but, yeah. But we, you know, we appreciate getting a little something, something, because it helps us in our relationships. But, but we don't need as much money as he needs. He's got a facility to operate. Uh, and, and Greg clapped his hand, so I'm, I'm not talking out of turn for my organization. We need, we, every, every community needs that, but it needs to be run out of community. It needs to be run by people that after the next election cycle, not gonna have to go find another job. And, and so, and then we can have some, some stability in the community. And I think the young people would be able to look at it. Like you get involved with something and then they stop doing it. So, so please uh, yeah. take care of this, this program. Yeah, thank you so much for that, sir. And uh, I, I definitely will echo the same thing as it relates across the board, because again, although we do those fundraisers, you know, uh, we have to keep these doors open. No matter what it takes, we have to keep these doors open. Young um, brother Greg, young brother Greg, I'm gonna say this to you: fundraisers don't raise money. Absolutely, they don't raise money. Absolutely. And when the and when the foundation world came to us and started talking about how y'all gonna be sustaining, I said, because y'all gonna continue to give us the money we need. Right. Yeah. You know, because if you expect the black community to be able to support what they need, you're out your mind. Right. Yeah. And so we made some traction in getting them to understand that. But I want city government to stop doing the work and start, and start funding organizations that know how to do the work and who will last past the next election cycle. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and I would like to make an earlier plea to my council members, my colleagues, to let's look at some of these nonprofits and look at that budget and start trimming some fat where it needs to be trimmed and give it to these programs that's doing the good hard work because uh, like like Mr. Ravis said, uh, all we have is Chuck E. Cheese and now jazz. We need more than that for our children. I see the kids like shaking their head in disbelief. Um, so thank you. Thank you for, for that presentation. Our next presenter will be the Youth Empowerment Program. I'm sorry, Youth Empowerment Project. Youth Empowerment Project. There, Mr. Jupiter. All right, Mr. Jupiter, I will, uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Councilmember King, for having us. Um, so I, I got this kind of last minute. I do not have a PowerPoint um, prepared. Uh, I'm happy to talk about, yep, what we do, um, who we serve, um, and answer any questions. So, so I can start with basic and overview. So we're Youth Empowerment Project, or yep. Um, we, are, we provide mentoring, education, enrichment, and job readiness training to young people ages seven through 24, and then some older adults as well um, throughout New Orleans and the greater metropolitan region. We operate out of six locations um, in Orleans Parish, in Mid City, in Central City, in Algiers, um, and then also um, in St. Charles Parish, where in our office in Honda. So we talk about our work in four different service areas. There's Yup Mentors, Yup Enriches, Yup Educates, and Yup Works. Um, our mentoring program is our flagship program. So Yup was founded in 2004 as the first of its kind um, mentoring and wraparound supportive services program for juveniles re-entering um, from incarceration. Um, we still have that program today. That's our Yup Mentors work. Um, but we realized rather than um, kind of, uh, I guess, intervention or, or after the fact, after young people have committed crimes, um, which is those services are key, um, but we really realized that prevention was key. And so we started a lot of mentoring and wraparound services uh, in the 
uh, prevention, community-based prevention world. So in our Yup and Riches, we run three different programs. So here in Central City, we have an after-school program for um, kids ages seven to 18, uh, where there's a lot of just basic enrichment. There's also homework help and tutoring, um, and then different arts and crafts. We also run a drum line and a dance team um, for our young people to uh, get experience in music and arts. We also have what's called a Camp Mariposa, which is a camp that is specifically, it's a therapeutic camp. It's a sleepaway camp that happens six times per year. Of course, things are a little bit on hold with the sleepaway camp right now during the pandemic, but we're still engaging young people. But the whole purpose is to target young people who have been impacted by substance abuse within their families um, and really kind of help them with different uh, therapeutic kind of um, training and also have some enrichment and fun in that as well. Our YEP Educates is our adult education programming. So we have two sites. We have the New Orleans Adult Learning Center um, in Mid-City, which is our largest uh, education center. And then also we have a satellite of that in Algiers in the Arthur Mundy Center. Uh, we are the largest adult ed provider that really focuses on what's known as opportunity youth or um, youth who are out of school um, or out of work um, between ages of 16 and 24. Uh, we are state recognized by Louisiana Community and Technical College System as an official high set provider. So prior to 2014, uh, many people still say GED, um, but was in Louisiana, we no longer take GED. We take the high set or high school equivalency test. Um, and we are a provider. We have over 500 folks with high sets. And then we also help folks transition into post-secondary and career opportunities. And our YEP Works programming. Uh, so we operate two um, public facing businesses here on rather Castle Haley Boulevard. We have a bike shop called Bike Works and we own a thrift, thrift store called Thrift Works. But within those shops, we also, it's really a training ground for young people. So yes, customers can come in and get um, bikes repaired or patronize our um, thrift store. But the main purpose is to really um, help our kids with skill development, um, social emotional learning, as well as our customer service training. And they also receive two credentials and they earn stipends while they're working with us. And then they have the opportunity to do an internship with us where they hone more skills, continue to earn stipend at a higher rate. And the goal is to put them on either a career pathway and connect them directly to work or into post-secondary or other educational um, opportunities. Um, all of our programs are absolutely free to um, all young people that we serve. Uh, we kind of have this little corny saying, um, no eject, no reject policy. So basically any young person who comes to us um, in need of services, we really feel that they, there's a place for them at Yep, and we can help them along that way. Um, we serve about 700 young people annually. Um, and we really provide really intensive wraparound services as well as skills development and also in enrichment. And kind of as to Mr. Dennis said, you know, we want to provide a safe space for kids to hang out as well. Um, that's kind of yep in general, um, the, 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 the elevator spiel. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I see Mr. Councilmember Morrell had his hand up, then Councilmember Harris. You're muted. Uh, no, you're not. Are you muted? I'm used. I'm sorry. I double mute. Uh, I appreciate. First off, it's great seeing you, Jerome. Thank you. Uh, to Mr. Dennis's point, I don't know if he's still here. If anyone followed my heated exchange with the, uh, I know, I know, Mr. Mr. King was there for it as well as Ms. Harris with some of the departments in the city and funding. Yep, was kind of part of that conversation. And what I mean, and to Mr. Dennis's earlier point, the city has really, in the last two administrations, gotten the business of creating these organizations that no longer fund nonprofits, but they actively compete with nonprofits. And to his point, the Kellogg Foundation is a great example. Those are organizations that come to our city and they want to supercharge and fund nonprofits that are doing good work. And what we're increasingly seeing in city government, and one of the things we're really going to address in the short term is, rather than supporting programs like YEP or like what Mr. Ravi is doing, or 
what Mr. Dennis is doing. Instead, we create multiple city agencies that not only hoard the city funding, but they actively go out and compete against the companies and the nonprofits that are providing the funding. Yep, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Jupiter has been around for 16 years. 17 and so forth, yes. The 17 years. So you've got an organization, it's been around 17 years, that when you ask them for a metric of success, they have to have one because that's how you attract donors, right? You guys can tell us what you're doing. And yeah. rather than the city of New Orleans supporting an organization that's been around 17 years, that is in some of the most hard hit communities, actually reaching kids and young adults and providing resources. Instead, what the city has done over the years is tilt into not only not supporting them, but crowding them out of the space they go into to do their work. So that's really what I had to say there, Jerome, because I know you and I, what's I've met before, I support everything YEP does. I think it's incumbent upon the city of New Orleans to fund nonprofits that are doing the work in the community and have a proven track record of success. You guys are one of my go-to success stories of this is why government should not be in the business of providing this service, these services, because it does change by administration. And when government is providing services, government judges itself on whether they're successful. You guys empirically, when you talk to every group that recognizes organizations and what they do and what they've done, you always get A pluses. And I know you guys do tremendous hard work. I've been to all of your facilities. I've toured them. I know what y'all do. And when I look at groups like you guys, like most Mr. Robbie's doing, like other groups are doing, and you talk to the kids who are in your programs, they love being there. And so I appreciate you being here today. I think your presentation is, is everybody who has not seen or witnessed what YEP does in Central City, you need to go visit. You need to go visit and see what YEP does. I'm already, I'm not going to take any more time. This is, this is Leslie's district. So I'm going to get out the way. But Jerome, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you and what you and Melissa are doing. Thank you, Council Member. Well, I appreciate all the kind words. We're trying to put our heads down and do the work, but we can't do it alone. And, you know, there are many of us who are doing this work. And, it, you know, there's a saying that, you know, mentor minds, no money, no mission. So we have to have money to sustain the work and continue to do good work. Thank you, Councilman Morrell. Yeah. Councilman Harris. So, uh, Jerome, I just want to also give kudos that JP and I are constantly in some sort of mind, mind meld situation. And so, he said everything and all the kudos that I would say to you. Um, you are an anchor of Aretha Castle Haley and continue to grow and anything that we can do to support that, whether it's zoning decisions or anything, I'm here for you. Um, it, I've been asked by people what they can do to help young folks. And I think volunteer opportunities with YEP, with some of the other organizations, being able to put those out there. So anything I can do to really promote those. But I do have a, a, a real question about how much money you receive from the city each year. So we receive some funding through our adult ed work, through uh, from the city. So we are a line item on criminal district courts um, budget for the New Orleans Adult Learning Center. So that is, and that's a partnership that started in 2007, um, then known as the Tulane Tower Learning Center because that's where we were located. But it's a partnership of City of New Orleans Youth Empowerment Project and Delgado Community College for the adult ed community site. So that is altogether um, almost $200,000 to provide services for adult education learners in the city. And what about for youth services? Because I know you you service a lot of young people um, around the city. Can you tell us how much money you receive for um, youth supported programs? We don't receive any city dollars. We have some fee for service contracts through our mentoring with juvenile court, with, um, uh, the Office of Juvenile Justice, and then with the 29th JDC out in St. Charles Parish um, for the River Parishes, but we don't receive, to my knowledge, 
any money um, for youth services directly from the city. Can you explain what the fee for services model is? You guys are actually, so you're happy, you provide services, you're getting paid for it. I assume that you're not getting paid a lot. <laughs> so it's not, it's not enough to sustain our work, no, because our, our, our wraparound supportive services are so intensive um, because our youth advocates or our mentors are working around the clock. They're responding to crises at two o'clock in the morning for young people. Um, they're being really, really proactive and making sure that young people have all of their other basic needs met that comes out of our general operating. Um, so it just is not enough to sustain the work. But those are the contracts that I was referring to that we've had with Office of Juvenile Justice since our inception. Um, so those are for mainly for youth who are returning from secure care. And so the goal is to work with them, provide the services so that they do not recidivate into either juvenile justice or criminal justice. And right. And that's that's what I wanted to point out to, to viewers watching. And I hate to interrupt is that there are there are organizations that provide mentorship services and other services. But you are specifically aimed at recidivism. Many of the programs are aimed at recidivism and preventing it. And so I think I commend you because a lot of folks don't want to take on the kids who are at the most risk in our community. Well, I have nothing else other than we should, as JP said, really evaluate where we're putting our money um, and how it can be most impactful. Thank you, Councilmember Harris. Thank you, Councilmember. I agree with everything you and Councilmember Morrell stated earlier. Mr. Jupiter, can you give us the number of children or youth that you service yearly, roughly, if you, if you can? So it was roughly between seven and 800. Um, that was a little bit more pre-pandemic. Um, and then we had to you know, shift to 100% virtual. We're happy to say now we're back up and running um, and in some areas almost at capacity um, as far as children are concerned. Our enrichment program, and we're seeing 50, 60 kids a day right now. So it's really great. Um, but that's, yeah, so roughly between seven, seven and 800 we're seeing annually. And most of these kids are, are kids that were once involved in, in, a, in, a, in a criminal justice system? Not really, no. So um, we do have that data. About 21% of our entire participant population. Now, that does include, I will say that, you know, our focus is youth because we're a youth empowerment project, of course, right? But in our adult ed uh, work, we have anyone can come in who's 16 or older. So we have a percentage of our student population in adult ed who are 25 and older. We often will we'll have it like, during the graduation, we might have a, a mother and a daughter across the stage together, something like that. But so, but our, our focus and the majority of our folks are in that seven to 24 year old range. Um, and, but I'm, but you're, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, your question was. The, the percentages, percentages. Oh, yeah, yes, the percentage, the percentage of that's reporting um, any criminal, um, yeah. sorry, any, any justice system involvement yeah. is uh, 20. 20%. So the vast majority either come self-referred um, or um, from a family member. And these are typically low income children? Yeah, so 81% of, or 84% uh, of our participants live below the poverty line. So I, I asked those questions just to give an insight to our viewers of the type of or the demographic of people that you're servicing. I think it's very important that we, not only as a city, but our business community, and just everyday citizens invest their money and time into and, and Yup, into Heroes, into Silverbacks, into every organization that's doing the work because we, anyone could be a victim of crime from that child who was ignored when he was 12 or she was 12 years old. So let's not wait until it's too late. Let's all work together and see what we can do collectively, um, whether it's volunteering your time or giving your money or, or both. Um, so that, that's what I totally agree with you, you know, and I, you know, that's it all the time. Folks, our, our, um, our kids don't fail systems. Systems fail our, our kids, right? Um, so we really need it. The onus is on us to really make sure um, that we're helping to prepare them for the, whatever their next step is. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Jupiter. I appreciate the time. Our next and final presenter will be Miss Rachel. Gasser from the Louisiana Center for Children's Rights and uh, 
I see Ms. Gasser is, is here. I thank you for being a trooper and bearing with us. So I, I wanted just to tell people that I had Ms. I know they came before to a criminal justice uh, committee meeting, but I really wanted to narrow this conversation to what it is that they see, again, as that, that finished product. So too often we see, oh, I'm going to just use this person as an example because they're the, the headliner. Mr. Tyrese Harris, I believe his name is, uh, the Costco person committed the Costco crime, along with other crimes. We see that end product, but I'm of the mindset that that person just didn't pop up overnight. Um, what did we miss collectively? What did we collectively miss that led this child and many other children like him to this point? So if Ms. Gasser, who sees and, and deal with our youth um, on a daily basis at the at the very early stage, um, can you can you give us um, just a sneak peek? behind a curtain as to what you see that creates the finished product that we see, um, the mug shot we see on, on the news at night? Um, so I can, I can uh, talk a little bit about um, that, but I wanna also um, mention that my colleague, Lana, uh, Lana Charles is here. She's a social worker okay. who works directly with our clients. Um, so she'll have more direct, um, be, be able to speak more directly to her experiences with our clients. And also I want to say trying to navigate the, um, uh, the services and programs that exist in our um, city and the ability of the kids and families to navigate that, which is also an important part of the puzzle that we haven't really talked about yet today. Um, but I kind of want to, um, well, first, before you know, going any further, I just, I want to say thank you, Chairman King, for giving us this opportunity, um, you know, not only for LCCR to present, but for creating this space for this incredibly important conversation. Um, it's been said many different ways today, but I, I really like the way that Mr. Dennis put it, which I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, um, which is something like, you know, we're willing to invest more in, in all sorts of foolishness than in our own, in all of our children. Um, and I think um, that's the way it's been, but I really have to commend this council for clearly making a commitment to do something different. Um, and for the recognition as well that solving the crime problem is going to require more than just law enforcement and incarceration, um, but a whole, a whole solution um, and investing in our kids and their families. And I wanna make sure that we're, we're looking at both pieces there, um, that that's such an important part of the puzzle. So, so thank you, um, Chairman King and the other members and the whole council for, for creating this space. Um, uh, and, you know, I also, um, you know, you mentioned the final piece um, in talking about um, uh, young gentleman, Mr. Harris, um, but I, you know, I kind of want to push back on that language and um, be, and I want to uh, reflect back on some of the incredible testimony from the young people who we heard earlier. And, and we heard some so many important ideas and insightful questions from them. But one thing I heard so many of them say is, you know, we're kids and we're struggling and we don't want you to give up on us. And I want us to really think about how that stands in contrast to the public narrative about kids in this city, and especially how we should respond when they cause harm to another person. And again, I, I wanna commend this council for pushing back against that narrative, um, but it is still very strong and pervasive out in the public. Um, and so I'm speaking about um, that you know, public response to, to you know, juvenile crime, not this council's actions per se. And, and I really do commend the council for trying to um, create space to, for a different conversation. Um, but the reason we have a juvenile justice system in this country is because of there was a recognition and a need to say kids are different. They're different from adults in so many different ways. And that has been borne out by the research um, you know, in child development, developmental psychology, and, and the research on the actual science of the cognitive structures of the brain. And, um, 
the brain, what the brain science research actually tells us is that the brain continues to develop until about the age of 25. Um, so an 18 year old is not a final product. Um, and so when we say that someone has reached this final point, it's not really accurate that there are, there is still an opportunity to, um, to reach that person and create some change. Um, oh, I did bring some slides, but this is actually still the, this is the presentation that I shared with the um, Criminal Justice Council. And um, I'm not gonna you know, go through it in detail. I just brought it because there might be some things that are relevant to reference, but um, you know, this is just there for reference, but we can um, just keep on the title slide for now. Um, I'm just kind of setting a frame for the conversation before I turn it over to Lana. Um, but as I was saying, the brain science research tells us that the brain is, continues to develop until about age 25. Um, so much later in life, um, uh, the mid twenties, in fact. Um, and and what, what actually it says is that late adolescence, so after age 15, is, um, is actually a very significant period of brain development when the structures of the brain that really start to make the connections where logic and um, good decision-making are, um, come together, that those parts of the brain are really starting to, to develop. And so if you actually think about your own experience in adolescence or that of your child or children, you prob this probably makes a lot of sense to you. I mean, I'm sure any of you, and I'm myself included, um, you know, were probably very different um, and thought very differently from the time you were 12 to 15, then from 15 to 18, and then from 18 to 25. Um, so, um, and this research has been so um, important and found to be so credible that the Supreme Court of the United States has actually relied on this um, in a number of Supreme Court decisions, including banning the death penalty for children. Prior to 2005, when the uh, Roper versus Simmons decision came down, we actually executed children in this country. And um, I'm sure, any New Orleanian knows all too well how recent 2005 actually was. Um, so um, what is the upside of this? Well, it's actually really good news because what it tells us is that all children are capable of immense change and that no matter what a kid does, we have the chance to turn their life around. And, and that's why council member Morrell um, authored the extremely important Raise the Age legislation, which unfortunately is potentially facing some threats at the legislature this year. So I hope that you will all join us <laughs> to um, defend that legislation if that is the co comes to be. And council member Morrell was also extremely uh, influential and authored a number of important other ju ju juvenile justice reform bills because of this fact that kids are different and they are capable of so much um, change that the juvenile justice system is actually by law has a different purpose than the adult system. It is, its purpose is rehabilitation, not punishment. And that's why, you know, I wanna go back to what Maya said. She said, it's never too late. And, and uh, we have the opportunity now to look at, um, you know, what, what really can, we can do to help all of our kids. And, and, and I want to emphasize what all the kids said and what Councilmember Morrell said, that the kids who are at the highest risk and the most need are the, definitely the ones that we should not be giving up on. Um, there are a couple of other things that I want to um, touch on about what the kids discussed um, that are relevant to my presentation. The first is how kids are portrayed or discussed in, in the public. And this is certainly not the council's fault um, in any way. I mean, as, as uh, Chairman King said, the council is not the media, but the council does have a role in, in, in what um, happens from here on out. And that you've you all taken the very important first step in, um, getting, in collecting and asking for data from all the, um, the important criminal justice agencies. And so um, I think if you go to slide, um, uh, I think it's slide, um, doo -doo -doo, what slide is this, five. Um, I just want to re refer back to this um, slide, which just shows that one of the most common narratives we hear is that this, there's sort of a slippage sometimes in the way people talk about crime. And they say crime and kids very um, 
sort of those things go back and forth as if they're the same. If we're talking about crime, we must be talking about kids. But in truth, kids are responsible for a teeny tiny percentage of all crime in the city. So I think it's just really important that we get out there and I'm taking <laughs> this opportunity to talk to the public and, um, and I, I encourage all people to, to push forward this, this fact that um, the, ma the vast majority of people who are arrested for crime, including violent crime in New Orleans are adults, not kids. Um, and um, the percentage of kids that are arrested for violent crime in the city is like 1%. Um, now, this is old data, and that's why it's so important that the, that the council is asking for new data. And if we just um, go forward to the next slide, um, actually, two more slides. Oh, no, so this slide, this slide is good. Sorry, you can keep it here. Um, what this slide shows is it pushes back against this very commonly stated myth about the revolving door. So this just says that, um, that kids who have more arrests in their history do get locked up when they're arrested, and they stay longer. Um, if they have prior arrests in their history. So, um, and then also I just wanna repeat that we heard in the special hearing on crime that um, the average length of stay in detention for kids at juvenile jail is 123 days. So um, just pushing back on that narrow, I'm, that is not a good thing. I don't support that um, because we, we know from the research on the um, recidivism rates for kids who get locked up that this is likely to increase reoffending, but um, but this is to show that there is no such thing as the revolving door that is often cited in um, public discourse. And then we go to the next slide. We see that um, that the vast majority of kids who come into the system only come in once or maybe twice, um, but there is a small, very very small number of kids who are coming into the system over and over again, um, again, to um, push back against the narrative that this is the biggest problem we're facing. And the reason, you know, I'm not just, I'm not just um, pushing back on this narrative. I, there are two reasons. One is because the kids were very right in pointing out that the, the public narrative about kids in New Orleans, specifically black kids in New Orleans, is extremely negative and extremely harmful. But also, because we're misidentifying the problem. If we really want to solve crime, we have to know where the problem actually exists. And if we're focusing all of our attention on a problem that in the, in the wrong place, we're not going to fix it. So um, that's, that's another reason why data is really important. And again, I commend the council. Um, I think that's the last data slide. Oh, um, just if you can go to, um, uh, just skip the next slide and go to the slide after that. I just wanna reiterate again, the importance, sorry, the slide before that. Um, I just wanna reiterate the importance of talking about race here. 100% um, of children who are in the detention center right now are black. And that is true almost every day of the year. Um, and when we have had um, decisions by the judges to um, ignore or, well, sorry, when we had decisions by the judges to um, create policies where they will detain certain kids um, based on, you know, uh, an expanded criteria, those have resulted in, they have affected a lot of Black children. Black children have been over um, affected by those, um, those policies. So since 2014, about a thousand Black youth have been affected, um, have been jailed via an override, which means a policy decision to jail kids who wouldn't otherwise be jailed according to the normal um, decision-making process that the court has used in the past. Um, so that's, that's one thing that I wanted to talk about um, regarding the public narrative around kids and crime. And, and then the last thing um, I wanted to talk about um, was you know, uh, the, the root causes and the underlying issues that the kids were talking about. And, and there's a couple of things I want to say about this before I move it over to Lana, who's going to be able to talk much more in detail about this. The first is we cannot ignore the negative impact of incarceration in this story. And this is um, this happens in, in a couple of ways. So one is mass incarceration in general, which we all know that Louisiana is the number one um, 
incarcerator in the world. And New Orleans is also is the number one incarcerated city in the world. Mass incarceration has torn families apart. And so when we talk about the fact that kids are growing up in families without fathers, that's a big reason why. And so if we continue to perpetuate, um, uh, if we continue to look to carceral solutions um, that, that, that will tear families apart, we're going to perpetuate that problem. And, and when we're targeting young people, and I'm not just talking about kids, but um, you know, young adults and throwing them in prison for long periods of time, um, and they may have children, those children are gonna grow up without those fathers. So um, we, I, we just have to be really mindful if there's a problem we're trying to solve, but we're making it worse by the policies we're perpetuating. You know, we're just biting our, cutting off our nose to spite ourselves. Um, another thing is that, that jailing children has really serious negative effects. First of all, as I mentioned before, research that came out just last year shows that, there, that it increases recidivism. Locking up a child in pretrial detention increases recidivism by about a third, um, including felony recidivism. And every single day that a child is locked up increases recidivism by 1%. So it's not just about kids that stay for long periods of time, every day matters. Um, it also um, really disrupts children's lives. It, um, even though we have a great school in the detention center, it disrupts kids' um, education, which I'm sure Lana can talk about. Um, it disrupts families. It's traumatic to children. It can be unsafe, um, although the incidents have gone down, number of incidents have gone down in the facility. They're not, it's not uh, foolproof. So um, we, we are doing this at a cost. And we cannot ignore that cost. And then um, if you go ahead and go to the last slide, um, I just want to talk about what I think was most moving about what the children said, which was, I'm sorry, that slide that you were on just before. <laughs> um, what the, tr the level of trauma that children in New Orleans are experiencing and the level of poverty that kids are growing up in are two of the, I think, biggest problems that we experience, that we see among our clients. And if we don't address those problems, we're not gonna get very far. And so um, I'll just turn it over to Lana now and she can talk a lot more uh, in detail about in particular those, those issues. And you can take the, the PowerPoint off. Yeah. Yeah, you could turn the PowerPoint off. Thank you, Chairman King, for allowing us to join the forum today. Um, again, my name is Lana Charles, and um, I'm a licensed social worker at LCCR. I've been doing um, this work in juvenile public defense for 10 years. Um, I'm also an advocate, a community member and a native New Orleanian and um, involved heavily with the community outreach of our city with other organizations um, such as the Baby Doll Ladies and doing programming with um, girl youth within the school systems with the Beautiful Foundation. So I'm quite familiar with the youth um, of our city. I've been working with youth for well over 15 years within the cultural arts community, education, and now in the justice system. And what I see is that we have youth that don't have the opportunities to use their God-given abilities in um, the right type of programs for our juvenile youth. Most programs are inaccessible to our juvenile youth teens. And at times it is hard for our families to be connected when there are other life events happening. So um, the kids need more than just referrals, right? Um, so they also need to be treated with TLC and understanding and given an opportunity to thrive and feel safe. The kids I meet are very witty, smart, talented, and determined that come through the system. They are so much more than what they are accused of doing. And everyone they interact with in and outside of the system needs to help them find and pull out that potential. Without that, the programs and treatment we try to provide won't be enough. All that being said, um, I also just wanna talk about the kinds of programming and services our kids are 
um, really do need. But before that, I wanted to read, read a quote from the book, What Happened to You by Bruce Perry. It says, what I've learned from talking to so many victims of traumatic events, abuse or neglect is that after absorbing these painful experiences, the child begins to ache, a deep longing to feel needed, validated and valued because, or begins to have, uh, take hold of itself. As these children grow, they lack the ability to set a standard for what they deserve. And if that lack is not addressed, what often follows is a complicated, frustrating pattern of self-sabotage, violence, promiscuity, or addiction. Again, that's from the book, What Happened to You by Bruce Perry. So I will move on to some of the specifics on, <clears throat> excuse me, programming and services our kids really do need. So of course, we all know we have to cultivate the interest and encourage new interests with our youth. We um, have to be mindful of housing stability, economic stability, educational stability, health stability, and civic and cultural engagement stability. If the home and school life is not stable, the child will often not be stable. I believe that the best way to support our youth's progress towards becoming productive youth in the community is to conduct a holistic evaluation of their strengths and their needs. I, myself, and my other colleagues, we use a positive youth development model, which recognizes housing, health, educational opportunity, work, vocational training, and support of adults as necessary for the healthy youth development and positive outcomes. So if the community as a whole is not offering that piece, pieces, you're not doing the best work. Um, this is distinct from a typical needs-based assessment, which is deficit focused on only, fo it only focuses on what is wrong with the child rather than what strengths he has that we can build upon in addition to what areas he may need help in. Researchers and practitioners <clears throat> report that young people possessing a diverse set of protective factors can and in fact experience more positive outcomes. These programs and interventions are strengthened when they involve and engage youth as equal partners. Ultimately providing benefits both for the program and for the involved youth. I think offering diverse programs will be helpful and we've already mentioned several of them such as sporting, STEM education, vocational training and creative activities, youth work opportunities, that actually offers consistent opportunity throughout the year, nonstop, a continuum, no gaps in between, of mental and behavioral health care. I have had youth disconnected from the mental and behavioral needs due to Medicaid being cut off while in custody, and it's taken a ton of time to be reestablished to the parent. I have had youth attending school with major behavior issues and not connected to a provider in the community and not getting IEP services in the school. It's important that families know their rights to adequate, to adequate education for their child. And some of the, 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 the barriers that I do see when connecting youth to mental health care in the community has been just a lack of follow-up um, with some of the mental health care agencies that are in the community. Um, my client's guardian wouldn't receive a phone call back in, a call back in due time when they really truly need it. The other barriers could be lengthy wait list, um, lack of funding, not enough practitioners in the field, several other reasons why there are, are barriers to um, reconnecting now you to the mental health care um, agencies within the um, community. The youth also wants to work really bad but don't get hired, can't work because of their age. You know, a lot of our kids are under the working age and they wanna work, they need it. They may have trouble getting to work or have trouble getting their basic vital records to work or filling out an application or even what to do next, like just simply not knowing what to do next. So direction and guidance is very necessary. So some of the youth serving agencies don't work on a timely matter, manner sometimes. 
especially when a child is ready to do something right away, i.e. as soon as they get released from custody. So time is of essence. We need to move quickly. So you have to catch them while you can. If you can't meet the need when they need it, you've likely missed the window of opportunity. So what we do also need more access and easier criteria to join these programs. So because of all of the other life events that are happening, it's very important that there's, it's easy access, open enrollment. If you require documents um, to, to, to participate in a program, then I believe the agency should help them get those documents, right? Um, help them get IDs. Lots of our kids need IDs to start positions and at, at work or, or programs. Um, maybe open it up to different schools that will be able to participate in, to, in these programs. Um, inclusivity is very important. Even though they are serving, even though we are serving Black youth, we still have to be or exercise the framework of diversity, equity, and inclusion with our programs. Um, some adults work in the system running the programs need more patience in helping the families figure out the next steps. Patience, patience. Helping them get the vital documents and whatever other documents that they may need is, is, is mostly the, 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 the main thing to get someone connected. Uh, programs that has a crew or the capacity to follow up with a phone call, a text, or even a visit. These are the requirements for those youth who are at most risk of deep system involvement. This is it. We can't have programs that think the parent will be able to drive their kids to your program on time every day. The reason being is that most parents are working hard to keep a roof over their head and food on the table or some may have their own troubles and need help. So we need more extended programming, offer open application windows for those that are just arriving through the system and not having to wait four to six months to apply when the next round of applications are available. Inclusive and equitable education is necessary. A lot of our youth are suffering with mental health and behavior issues and not receiving the proper treatment and accommodations in the school setting. In teaching, we should be adaptable and understand the importance of differentiating instruction. Instead, we have a lot of zero tolerance and what's wrong with you attitudes being served. So I have a youth, um, there's a story here. I have a youth um, basically doing everything himself. He went to rehab, came back home, new person, got a job on his own. We've been trying to reconnect him to school as well. We referred him to the YEP um, Educates. Um, one of our closest partners ever. The youth ignoring, so the youth was ignoring the phone calls from YEP to get him connected to his high set program. But guess what? YEP kept hounding him, calling him nonstop. Now he's agreed to take his tape test and he's connected. That's what's needed. Without YEP doing that, I don't think he would have even made this next step. So, because he was really truly just focused on working, making money, taking care of himself. When we all work together, things work out. Not enough programs do this kind of persistent legwork, but this is what's necessary for kids who need a lot of support. Um, a program that provides a service isn't just enough. They need to make sure the kid can and will actually get the service it provides. And yes, this is a responsibility that should be on the program, not the kid, because the kid is in the program precisely because he needs help and support. So navigating these multiple systems at once is hard. This is why we need more partners and players out in the community willing to do the hard work and not just make referrals. The entryway into programs and services have to be streamlined and accessible to those who can't reach it not to assume someone is, has everything together. It's very noticeable when youth are shortchanged because they began to act out. That is our alarm. It's a red flag to do and pay attention to what they need. Instead, we punish them. But um, I can tell you from experience that only makes things a lot worse. Thank you guys so much for giving me that opportunity to speak. 
Thank you, Ms. Charles and Ms. Nassar. At this time, do we have any questions or comments from any of the council members? Ms. Leslie Harris, is council member Harris is saying no. Councilman Morrell, none. I do have a, a quick question. Um, of the, the youth that you all service, how many of them are African-American children? Percentage, roughly. I, I don't have that data accessible, but I would guess it's very close to 100%. Lana, do you have anything different? Okay. Yes, pretty sure. Very close to 100%. All right, and yes. out of that 100%, how many are boys? Um, uh, again, I'm, I'm guesstimating here, but probably 90%, something along those lines. About 90% of the youth that you all service, um, and just to be clear, you all are the, the public defenders basically for you. Yes. Um, some of the children you serve are, are young black boys. Right. So I just want to make it very clear, and, and I stated this when I first, to the first council meeting, not here to make, uh, sometimes people have to be uncomfortable to, to get to the, to the bottom, to the root cause of these situations. And, and we are failing our young black boys. Um, that's, there's no other way to put it. Um, I think we have to do better as a society when we, we, we look for a solution. We need to be real with each other and say, well, if, if 90% of the youth that are being arrested, I guess, or having representation are young black boys and we need to put 90% of our resources um, Maybe that, that may not be the, the best, you know, what I'm saying is they need resources. They, they need, they need, um, they need help. They're crying out for help. And I, I don't want to come across as being soft on crime or anything like that. But I want to leave this um, with, with the public to think about. If you're 18 years old today in, in, in New Orleans, and which is the, the age of the, again, Mr. Harris, uh, 2004, is when you were born and now we're in 2022. So the book in events of your life is Hurricane Katrina and Ida slash COVID when you've been out of school for the past two or three years. Mm -hmm. An adult has a tough time coping with either one of those situations. So we expect our youth who, who mentally are not developed fully um, with no job, and really, one they didn't actually be here. They're just trying to survive. We expect that with you to have it all together and to be perfect. Um, and when they don't, we turn our heads or we wag our finger at them. Um, so I just want to give the people that to chew on. The book end of a, of a teenager's life, the booking events is Katrina, Ida, and COVID. So just kind of let that, with, with the chaos going on in the middle. And then I want to correct myself. Um, that is not his final um say Ms. Gasser, his final picture that's the most current he does he definitely as well as other children have time to make a difference make it make a change in their life and we pray and hope that they do that um so that's all that i have again no other question or the comments or concerns thank you all for the presentation thank everyone else um, who came on and presented especially our youth our uh, our children so at this time i'll have uh, like to make a motion to to adjourn I'll second it. Second it. Councilmember Harris. Um. Before we go, Freddie, I did want to, Chairman, I did want to say one thing. This has been a fantastic meeting. It has been an eye opening, excellent meeting. And I think, especially the participation we had earlier from actual young people who are in the process, this was very illustrative. And I know for you and I have been working on this for a long time about funding going where it needs to go, not where people want it to go. I think you've really framed the conversation very well for what's going to happen in the coming weeks as far as how we're going to deal with funding going forward. So okay. thank you for having this meeting. It was really it was a really good meeting. No problem. I look forward to tomorrow when we dive deeper into some of these cause and effects and what, what creates what we see today. So um Thank everyone for attending and have a nice day.